Joe Papillardo. Yes, sir. Thanks for coming in. Absolutely. Good to be here. Thank uh, you. I'm just amazed, man. You have, you've done a lot of cool things. You wrote a book on sunflowers. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was the first book. That was the uh, freelancing, desperate, you know, I had an agent but no idea, which is pretty rare. So my thought, what hasn't been written before? I like commodities books a lot. So uh, um, it was, you know, cod, salt, all that sort of genre. So I knew that people were interested in that, and that was a way to do it. But what commodity? So sunflowers, you know, they I saw sunflower oil was being exported to Saudi Arabia. And I thought, hey, we're, the United States is exporting oil. <laughs> <laughs> sunflower oil is out and from there the whole book sort of sprung up so so what's it about how does it work what, what are some things that people would be blown away by uh, you know the thing that my background is is certainly defense reporting and science reporting and that's sort of the and in history as well and that's the sort of the tack i took on the sunflower book so the big sort of bombshells no pun intended are the evil horrible people who are involved in making the sunflowers a very, you know, successful species, you know. I say that they're sort of like cats or dogs. They, like, align themselves with humanity very, very early in both of our evolutionary stages, the flowers and, and humans. And over that time, there's been certain people that have propelled the flower, right, and, and made it a global commodity. Peter the Great is one of them, not the nicest guy, right? Um, <clears throat> the the communist Russian um, uh Definitely, Russia had a huge influence on making it a, an actual commodity, the, the oil. So there's a lot of World War II history involved in that. And it, it's not the reason, but one of the reasons why Germany wanted to invade the Soviet Union in World War II was commodity envy. And one of the things they were envious of was sunflower fields and sunflower oil. And so when they were taking over these Russian areas, they would take over the sunflower processing f- facilities and they were using that to ship goods back home to make things for the German people that they were being denied because of the blockades and because of all because of the war, right? So here's sunflowers completely in the background, and here's Goebbels talking about sunflower oil and and trotting out the statistics on what is soap, it used for? Making soaps, uh, a lot of it, uh, in anything that you need a fat for, you can use a sunflower oil for. So breads, food for starters, and then also making soaps and and tech. So there's a lot of different sort of uses, gun oil, um, grease for, for, uh, not, not, is lubricants, not grease necessarily, but but replacing grease. So it was a front line and also, you know, uh, in the uh, morale building thing. So you're invading Russia, you're taking over sunflower factories and you're shipping it back home. I'd never heard any of this stuff, right? Like, yeah. Um, and, Same till right, right now. <laughs> till, and, you know, Osama bin Laden, another prominent sunflower grower, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is totally mind-blowing to me as well. So all of these stages of history, there are these things. So, yeah, he um, – when – early on, before he went to Afghanistan, he – one of the, his little enterprises that he set up was sunflower fields, and he would press the oil and sell it off and every all of that. So it's an easy, very hardy crop. And that was one of the things he was into while he was organizing, um, you know, what became his terrorist network. That was one of the ways that he would fund, you know, his fighters. You got to, you got to, you got to feed the monkey. Okay, so <laughs> many questions on this. Yeah, I go. Uh, <laughs> this is the old book. You see the new stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, he. Uh, how big is a field? How big are, are these like thousands, tens of thousands of acres? How long does it take to grow? What kind of weather? Does it grow in lots of different weather? Yeah, the thing with sunflowers is that they're very, you could do a very small scale. And people did, you know, peasants basically did, um, gardeners do. But you can also industrialize them to huge fields, like the ones that you see in France and those endless sort of um beautiful fields that go off into the horizon rolling along the hills these things want to spread (laughs) these things want to hybridize too they want to mate with each other and make new kinds of sunflowers which is great evolutionarily speaking but it makes it kind of hard to keep very pure strength so you got to put these little condoms on their head so they don't sort of (laughs) breed when you don't want them to we're talking about the same sunflower these are frisky (laughs) promiscuous flowers they're used for evil that's one of the things in the book that they point that used for a lot of good things too don't get me wrong but there's a there's a full history and, and anything that's allied with humanity is going to get the good and the bad. So out of one sunflower, you know, one five foot tall sunflower, how tall do they get? The, well, that's the mammoth Russian. Those can get 
that big and, okay. and even bigger. So five foot sunflower. How much oil are we getting out of one five foot? Jeez. Okay. Well, out of those, not that many because they're built for looks. Those are the ones that you oh, sell, okay. right? The industrial ones are are a lot different. Um, they're they're not as tall. On um, the wild sunflowers have many heads, but all almost all the ones that are commercial have one single head. So I don't know. I've never pressed sunflower oil myself, but I mean, um, each seed is packed with this oil. So it's. I remember looking. This has been many many years since I even read that book, even though it's mine. Um, but the yield on that is almost as good as soy. So whatever soy is. So it's it's competitively um, rich in oil. And each of those seeds, you take one and just, you know, get it out of the shell and feel it. And you can feel all the oils. It's saturated with that. It's a little sponge. So it's a really, and when you're eating, you get all those oils too. It's really good for you. All right. So that was first book. That was the first one, yeah. Second book? Oh, yeah. Um, Years, <clears throat> excuse me, years and years later, I got to Popular Mechanics where I worked for about seven and a half years. I worked for Smithsonian Air and Space before that, and then they poached me to cover defense and space flight for Popular Mechanics Dream Job in New York City. Um, so I moved up there from, from Washington where I was working at Smithsonian. And uh, along the way, the, over seven years, I started going, <laughs> abusing my position. My bosses were super cool. They would let me go and self-deploy um, as long as I would write something about it. <laughs> cool. So I'm catching every rocket launch I can. I'm going to Canaveral, starting with Cape Canaveral, the last shuttle launch, and then going to Vandenberg, watching ICBM launches, going to uh, French Guiana to see the, the uh, Europeans launch. And is that there. popular mechanics tag gets you in everywhere? Yes. <laughs> it's not my, it's not because they love me. <laughs> um, they, they came to trust me over time, going, uh, Spaceport America and, and now Boca Chica. So I'm covering all these places and I started getting all the cutting room floor material and then permission from these places to, um, uh, the, the, from the, uh, not just popular mechanics, but the other places I wrote for. Um, as a freelancer over these over time and just say, here's what happened at commercial space flight in the last, you know, four or five years. Here are the places where it's happening. I call it Spaceport Earth. Um, and that came out in 2018, I think. Um, so that was really fun because it gave me an excuse to go to even more launches and, uh, and, and really just capture the people and the places. It was like a travel log, you know, go to Cape Canaveral, go to the diner where the astronauts go. There hadn't been an astronaut in a really long time launching from Cape. So try to humanize these places and to make space flight a little bit more real um, by focusing on the places where the rockets actually leave from. So that was really a fun, a fun project. Tell me what happened. It seems like we were gun ho on getting to the moon. We got to the moon Mm -hmm. and then we just, nothing happened. Like what happened? The, the short answer is that NASA got to the moon. They, they, there was follow-on missions that were planned. They ended Apollo, and the, the big shift was, well, let's do something in Earth's orbit. Um, let's build a space station. Let's build a workhorse um, launch system like the space shuttle was supposed to be, and let's live in space. Let's get humans out into the International Space Station. Let's make it an international thing. This isn't the Cold War. We're going to go and plant a flag. No, let's do a collaborative thing in, in Earth's orbit which is all fine and good, but it was at the expense of the moon. And I interviewed Buzz Aldrin once, and, and he said, oh, well, we've been to the – he didn't say we've been. He said, I've been to the moon. There's no reason to go back, essentially. <laughs> and I was like, you know, there's a ton of unanswered questions, things we can do there, our closest neighbor, the ultimate high ground, you know, uh, dark side of the moon, tele, you know, telescopes that can, you know, peer, you know, into the deepest – fathoms of the cosmos and all this stuff. There's a lot of reasons to go back to the moon, mining, ice, you know. He was of that mindset that there's no reason to go back because we had done it. If you're just talking about an achievement, fine. But there's a, if you're talking about reasons to go back, yeah. it makes a lot of sense to go back. And then uh, Bush administration had a program to go back. Obama canceled it. Trump resurrected it. And now wisely, I think, you know, realizing that this – jerking back and forth funding defunding every couple of years isn't it's already hard enough on nasa you got to pick a destination to stick to it the Biden administration is basically sticking to that we're going to go to the moon and then we're going to go on to mars from there 
Um, and that's a, entirely, entirely in lockstep with what the Trump administration was doing. So in terms of space flight, there's no difference. There's big differences between the administrations, but um, <laughs> no, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but in space flight, that daylight is very, it's hard to see. Well, it's, except it's, when it, Trump did it, it was bad. And now it'll probably be good. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the weird, well, there's, there's definitely that, especially on the space beat. You know, that it, it definitely, there's not a lot of Trump love, except that there is. And it's uncomfortable love because, you know, they're working for outlets that are, pretty steadily anti-Trump across the board. And here's space where Trump was actually doing a really solid job. And Jim Brindenstein, who was a very good head, is now being replaced by this old guard asshole. You know, um, Bill Nelson, who tried to kill commercial crew, which is the best thing to happen in NASA. And the only point of continuity, Bush started it. He said, let's get commercial companies to start launching stuff. They can own the hardware and sell it to other customers. Great idea. Yeah. Oh God, Obama's killing everything in space. He did not kill that. He, actually, the people inside there really supported it. And Brendan Stein was one of those people. So that continued through Trump. And now it was like, oh God, is Biden going to backslide and really kill the only thing in space flight that's actually working better than anticipated and getting hardware and people off the planet and starting a whole kickstarting a whole new industry? Why would you put this old guard, guard Bill Nelson guy in there? So that's a that's one thing that people don't like. But the funding's been steady. The plan has not changed. He didn't do the Obama switch on it, right? Yeah. Um, it's smart, you know. Maybe I, I don't know. Maybe it's lazy, but who cares? You know, <laughs> when government is lazy, good things sometimes do happens as well. Or maybe it was just a good idea, you know. It, yeah. Usually if three or four administrations of different parties agree on something, it's a horrible idea. You know, it's something so stupid that only they can agree on it. But or there's the rare time that like, yes, this is such a good idea and it's yielding such real things. And we can go through some of the details of what it's actually doing. But there's been a huge sea change within NASA. Um, they don't own launch vehicles. They rent them. That's, you know, they own the hardware that lands on them you know, on the moon or, or goes and, and looks at black holes of the sun or whatever. But they don't own the vehicle to get them there. That's someone else's. They, they designed great stuff. They did great things. It, it was, took a long time and, and it was extremely expensive. So getting the commercial companies in a real competition is going to open up, yeah, always. open up space. Like, and you know, things get better. And things get better for pretty much everybody. You're seeing a lot of ways of how like the space economy trickles back down to earth and how space science is so important no matter what you kind of care about there's a space application if you care about the climate boom there you go if you care about pretty much it crops you know agriculture you know pollution crime i could name it defense it's going to be there's going to be a space component to it so it's it's never been more important and now thanks to that continuity between all those administrations and the commercial crew program we're competitive yeah in that, as, as a know. country and sort of as a species too i like the space force logo I'd wear it on a jacket if I could find a cool jacket with it. Good old Space Force. <laughs> that was, imagine that, that that would survive an administration change because that was a pretty big overreaction to a very real set of threats. Like that was, there's a lot of things you could do about military, you know, military threats in space. The Obama, um, sorry, the Trump administration, easy mistake. The Trump administration um, went the biggest, boldest way to address those. Shocker. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it was better than nothing, and it makes sense, and the people that are in charge of it, who have all been kept in charge of it, are pretty reasonable people. Um, they're doing some very smart things to keep it small, keep it lean. It's not a crazy power grab that's going to cause a lot of problems so far, right, if that could change. But for the birth of a service, um, which doesn't happen that often, because now this is on par with the Marine Corps. This is on par with the Air Force. You know, they're sitting in the same ta- you know meetings. Um, it's it's been pretty smooth so far. I, I thought there'd be a lot more political bloodletting and infighting. Maybe it's coming, but um, now that um, Biden said it's going to stay, I think it's got it's got a lot of bipartisan support. They carry a lot of heft, so I think Space Force has a pretty bright future. And people don't understand that. And Steve Carell's an idiot. <laughs> he doesn't understand anything. Um, <laughs> and, and, that is, and, he's, and it wasn't even funny. That was the biggest crime. But, you know, from that lowly start where it was a joke, uh, you know, it, it could actually be something that's very, very serious and w- worth looking at. They're doing a lot of cutting-edge crazy stuff. Okay, so sunflowers. 
yes. space. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then now World War II history was your third book that came out in December? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it, the, if there's any writers out there, it pays to be versatile, like focus a, a, on something and become a, an expert or at least familiar, or at least know what experts to call. But don't get so focused that you get pigeonholed. And I love aviation because it's so huge. Um, Sunflowers had an entire chapter called Space Flower, um, which was all the sunflower experiments in space, of which there was a lot of them, I found out. Thank God. <laughs> um, filled out the chapter nicely. Um, then the, you know, the space book obviously came from engineering, reporting, and, and covering all, all facets of space flight. And then history has always been a big, um, a, a big component of this, where things come from. The evolution of technology is a big popular mechanics kind of a, a, a f- something they always fall back on. Um, machines evolve like life forms do, but, and for very good reasons. And it's a really good way of describing how something works, saying where it came from, what problems it had, and how it changed to address them. That was the World War II book that I wrote. It was about the World War II, the bombing campaign over France um, and uh, the 8th Air Force and a guy named Snuffy Smith who uh, received the Medal of Honor and got demoted. He was sort of a, a rascal and had a lot of a lot of problems before, during, and after the war. Not you can cuss on here, by the way, so if you don't want to call him a rascal, you can. I, rascal? <laughs> oh, thank you. I will, I, I by will the way, cu- just letting you know. There's- <laughs> he's, a, he's, he's not a sympathetic character in many ways, but he's a very human, real person. I wanted to put a real person in World War II. Right. And, you know, all this stuff, uh, you know, this Tom Brokaw, Greatest Generation, it's not bullshit. I mean, yeah, they they did all that. But calling them that makes them sacrificial lambs. Like, oh, we're going to go over there and we're just like put on this earth to die for democracy. And it's like these guys wanted to live. They wanted to get laid. They wanted to get rich. They wanted to (laughs) to live, you know, most importantly. And they're real people. And, and, you know, they weren't – and. It's okay to say that they womanized and they abused their privileges, and it doesn't make them any less brave or crazy to go up in those planes. And it makes it, it it makes them not more heroic but more real. And I think that's a lot more important these days when everyone's so polarized. Yeah. Um, and it's a sort of a nuanced story. People love heroes and they love villains, and there's a lot of currency in naming a villain or naming a hero. But this was a designated hero who didn't act like a hero. He's not a villain, although he did a lot of shady things. Um, but he was a real guy, and the family was very pleased with the way the book came out because it was fair. You don't have to be nice; be be fair. Uh, look at what he did, and there's a lot of his detractors who were heaping things on him that he didn't do. Now he could have done them because that was his personality type, but he didn't. You know, um, he earned what he earned, and he, you know, and I just tried to lay so it out. How does a, a medal narrative. of honor get stripped away? It doesn't ever, but okay. he got demoted back to private, which is, think about it. Um, the Medal of Honor is, a, it's a very, I don't want to say political, but it's a very public thing to bestow on someone, especially in the middle of the war, especially in World War II. It was, he was the first non-enlisted to, uh, airman to get the Medal of Honor who was alive. It was a big deal, right? Um, it was covered internationally. Uh, the the Secretary of War shows up to hang it on his neck in England. It was a gigantic publicity push. It was before the Memphis Bell, but it was the same template. Pick a hero, anoint the hero, trot the hero out, war bonds, morale, and the rest of it will follow. It's what we can do because the air war, we're losing 50% of our crews in a lot of these missions. Things are not going well. We need something to rally behind. Wow, here's this very short ball turret gunner <laughs> who like puts out a fire and saves his crew and fight, you know, he's fighting off the, you know, <laughs> German planes that are coming and all in this, all in his first mission. And he's this little guy who can like deliver a snappy, um, snappy dialogue. And he's very quotable. Perfect. Mm, maybe not so perfect. He goes back to base and starts abusing his privileges pretty horribly and brazenly not showing up to work. It, it's not only that he wasn't flying anymore, because he stopped flying after five missions, you give someone, you you get the medal and you make it public, and then they get killed. It's kind of a downer, right? It's yeah. not good, as good for morale <laughs> as you'd want. So uh, that part I understand, but the the but the part that's hard to imagine is 
the person who demoted him, and I have the memo where he recommends his demotion, all the things he did wrong, and how far he had to be pushed to get this demotion to happen. Like, we can't have him in the bomb group. It's just too, it's too much for me. I can't do this. I'm trying to plan the war. You know, D-Day is coming. We need to get this place in order. So, um, And what's this book called again? This is Inferno. Okay. Um, and it, it's, uh, it, that just came out in December. And then you're working on your fourth book. Can you give any details there? Yeah, the fourth book is a complete outlier from everything I just said before because it has nothing to do with aviation, has nothing to do with airplanes, or t- and very little to do with technology. Uh, it's about the Texas Rangers. Uh, it doesn't. It does fall into that hero villain kind of dynamic, though. A lot of things I'd read with the Texas Rangers were either trying to be really sweeping and cover the entire history of it, or one ranger his entire career and and you know his and usually his very heroic career right um or if it's like cult of glory you know here's a all the misdeeds all collected in one very comprehensive well documented um well sourced volume right but it's a it's an agenda book right um well very well done right but you read it it's not a great story you know what i mean like i, I like to think of myself more of like a storyteller so if you want to make those points you kind of pick one example and use that to illustrate a, a bigger point, right? So I looked at Cult of Glory and I looked at some of these other books and there's the people who hate the Rangers, you know, sort of historically for all the things they've done wrong, which are, you know, they're voluminous. I don't know any of them. What did they do wrong? So, okay. <laughs> we'll do the Ranger bashing first. Cause, and it is totally legit, by the way. Um, but it's, just, it's when you choose to focus on them and as an organization – really affects how you think about them um they're formed to fight indians right so that's a nasty business you know <laughs> on both sides but really nasty on the ranger side too they're really taking it to the villages right so you have a whole generation of those rangers who come come up then the indians are beaten right that settles down what are the rangers going to do well there's all these outlaws, there's all these fence cutters, there's, you know, Texas is growing and it's growing wild and crazy. There's a lot of boom towns, the trains are showing up, lumber companies, there's a lot of boom going on. And with the boom comes just craziness. Um, The state needs to exert control over all the municipalities, all the corrupt cops, all the um, fence cutters who are, the fence cutters are the open range, um, was close, getting closed off for economic reasons and because Texas was kind of getting crowded so that the larger cattle owners and cattle barons could seal off their land with fences and black block access to, like, water or good grazing. And the smaller ranchers were really used to having their cattle go wherever they wanted, and that that's really grossly oversimplifying it. But that led to basically an insurgency in Texas where they'd go and cut fences and – Criminals would do it, deputies would do it, citizens would do it, um, you know, everyone was in on it on some level. So you get this mix of, of people who are going out on these raids, and the rangers were there. So there's all this craziness, and then so the state wanted the rangers to hunt down these people. Those people, for the most part, are white. They're in the Anglo establishment. They're, a lot of them, politically connected. They're not Indians, right? This is a whole different subset, and the and – this is when the first time also, this is in the 1880s, right? This is the time <laughs> when not I'm... not that long ago. That's so crazy. It really isn't. It, uh, yeah, the, the things that were happening then were just are, are very much still happening now in, in a lot of ways. But um, I try to cover that a little bit in the book without making it too much of a stretch. But they were focused on outlaw hunting, and that was a totally different demographic. And the pushback that they got from that was from the Anglo establishment, district attorneys bringing up rangers on murder charges. That That's one of the things that happens in my book. Um, in, a, in a jurisdiction where uh, an, in, an Indian police agent, which is a federal agent hired by the feds, got shot and killed, and the district attorney wouldn't press charges because the victim was Native American. And then when a U.S. Indian agent is involved in the shooting I cover, that same district attorney brings the cop up on charges because, because he killed a white guy. <laughs> so it's like the racial politics are there, but, but, the, but it's all being 
you know, the pushback is being applied by the Anglo establishment because that's who they're killing, right? Everyone in my book, by sheer happenstance, everyone who was killed is white, um, which is kind of weird for the Rangers. They shoot and kill one Mexican guy towards the end. I mean, shoot and wound um, one, one guy at the end. But after this phase, outlaw hunting, the Mexican Revolution happens, and Texas decides, well, we need – we don't need lawmen. We need a bunch of mounted militia members to protect the border. And, and wow, what if the Mexican revolutionaries are taking root here and there's a, a, there's a craze and there's incidents, legit incidents that, that spark a complete craze, right? And that sparks what they call the special rangers. And the governor has, you know, signs up a whole bunch of yahoos who shoot the place up, commit all kinds of horrible atrocities. Um, and that's a cult of glory covers the Indian part, and then really covers that part as well. There's uh, Jose Canales has a commission year, a couple of years later that really lays out all the atrocities, going house to house, dragging people out, and, and documenting the exodus um, You know, to the level, honestly, like you can apply genocide to it um, because of the outcome the violence drove everyone out of the valley who was mexican not everyone but a whole hell of a lot of people and canales fought back against that one of the people he calls uh, i'm sorry one of the people called during those hearings is one of the rangers i covered and the two of them have this exchange they really like each other and he's like could you imagine your rangers doing the kind of bullshit that these guys are doing (laughs) And he's like, no, <laughs> like if, if they're doing that kind of thing, if they're shooting prisoners and they're going to houses, the whole force should probably be abolished instead of this. Pretty, pretty, pretty strong stuff coming from a guy who was tied in with that organization, had friends who were being accused of the very crimes that and were guilty of the crimes that that, that Canales was exposing at the time. So you've got these like, sorry, we've got these. Phases of Rangers, right? And then after the Canales um, investigation, there was a big slate of reforms. It got rid of the, the special Ranger guys and focused back on outlaw hunting, law enforcement. You're not a mounted militia. You're not, you're not the military. You're not, that's not what you're good at. Fight criminals. Fight public uh, corruption. Stop lynching. Stop riots. They were employed against strikers. Uh, pretty much always calm stuff down don't go in and make stuff worse and keep it a small elite force it's only focused on law enforcement don't do the border stuff don't patrol your own people no don't be cops don't be militia and it took a lot of lessons over all those years to actually learn that um and that's that's sort of the backdrop a lot of people skip from the atrocity phase to the atrocity phase And they think that the outlaw hunting phase is sort of in the middle and it's a given. The people who hate the rangers think, oh, well, they were, all right, well, they they hunted outlaws and they were good at that, but let's, you know, but they did these other things. Okay, and then the the pro-ranger people, well, you never focus on the outlaw hunting. This is what they were best at. (laughs) It's like, has anyone stopped and actually looked to see if they were good at outlaw hunting and how they did that? Like, because I don't know. I'm, you know, so my publisher said, do you have a Texas Ranger idea, like a book idea in you? Because we, because they saw, well, we want to do one, but we have no idea where to go after Cult of Glory. And, you know, what, what's it? Said, Get a good story, you know, just tell a good story and let people decide for themselves it's, it's to see what happened during this sort of forgotten era. Um, and that's what I did. I found in East Texas feud and i want to give too much away but there's the one of the worst shootouts in the ranger history happened in east texas in 1887 and so i picked the one company and i put that in the middle and i and there was two years and they were involved in four shootouts big shootouts this is one company and i thought well that's got to be rich you know they're all different people that they were hunting (laughs) right they're all different kinds of people like some of them were desperado types some of them are um, stagecoach robbers. Some of them are a family that just went outlaw after um, after they were sentenced and found guilty of murder. They broke out of jail and went up into the hills, and they were hunting them. And then there was, like, a politically connected fence cutter group. So, like, all these different kinds of criminals were sort of representing different kinds of law enforcement that the Rangers were doing at the time. 
and you can apply how good or bad they were at that on those different things. Great against fence cutters. It really plays to their strengths. Intelligence gathering, undercover operations, and then shooting them down, you know, as needed. And then rounding them up for the for the court trials, making their life as uncomfortable as possible to stop the fence cutting. It's a counterinsurgency, basically. And they were good at that, actually. They did a really good job during my little phase. Um, out in East Texas, it's a lot different. They're in different terrain. How many Texas Rangers were there? Hmm? How many Texas Rangers were there? Uh, back then? Yeah. There were, it was companies, I think, A through F, and there's 10 Rangers per, so not that many. And they covered the whole state. <laughs> and they, they're, that's the other part you never hear. They were overworked like crazy. They're getting dropped into situations they had very little idea what was going on a lot of times. They were taking the word of the people who were there um, who called them. So that's the state you know, the state's people, so judges or big landowners or whoever was most threatened would be the ones who would get the ranger attention. That means they would show up and they were just, they weren't just following orders because they had a lot of leeway, but their targets were selected for them and they would do what they had to to bring them down. So were they just like moderate, like uh, Navy SEALs? (laughs) In a weird way, they were an elite, let's consider that for a second. They're an elite, well, I, elite's kind of hard. They were treated like an elite. <laughs> I look at the recruitment and I'm like, it's hard because one of the guys, you know, killed three people before he became a ranger. And the reason he joined the rangers because he was on the run from, you know, revenge killings. So, I mean, like, they weren't, uh, they didn't have any strict, <laughs> yeah. you know, criteria. They weren't, like, but they had to be badass. They had to be unafraid to kill people. And they had to be, even more importantly, very seasoned on the trail. If you can't ride 70 miles in a day and do it day after day, you can't be a ranger. So these are all guys on horses. Yeah. Is there a certain kind of horse that's better for this stuff? Uh, they, uh, probably. <laughs> they, um, yeah, I'm not a horse guy. Definitely. What kind of guns? You know that? Worker. Yeah, I got the whole guns. Oh, yeah, the man. Winchesters. And I went to a... Um, are they carrying multiple guns on them? Yeah. They How were, much ammo are they keeping a, on them? A Winchester and a revolver with standard gear. Right. Um, the cool thing about horses, though, they would, um, before I forget to say this, they w- had to buy their own horse. But when they would, the horse got tired or burned out or hurt or died or whatever, they could apply to the rangers to get a new one. And they always, always, always overcharged by like, you know, at least half. So they, <laughs> it was like a good income stream when you swapped out horses. So a little <laughs> Texas ranger back then, uh, how to make ends meet, work the system. But the, but the weapons, you have to have a Winchester um, and you had to have um, your, your six shooter, right? Your, your army Colt six shooter. The reason why is because they use the same ammo. And through hard lessons in previous generations of rangers, you don't want to be reaching and reloading in the middle of a big firefight and load the wrong ammo. So they both use for um, the same ammunition. Which is? 440. Okay. Um, they had the double rings of it on their belt loops, and they'd fold, <laughs> fold the belt over and keep money in there, and then like a little tool for tightening. What were their um, outfits? Did they wear hats? They always wore hats, no badges. Um, they were pretty well-dressed. Um, at, I mean, at the camp, they would just wear overalls and, you know, kick around, uh, you know, in the dirt but or in the, their canvas tents. But when they would go into town, they would dress in, they would call it the city clothes. Um, the girls, they would say, love them in their city clothes because they're f- surrounded by farmers, you know. Um, they were dashing. They were hardened from the trails, so like good physiques, you know. And they had a big selection of women, right? I mean, most, you're a farmer or a shop owner or even a county doctor or whatever, you have whatever women are around you to choose from, <laughs> and that's it, right? You're a Texas ranger. You're wandering around. You're meeting all the, you know, all the, the wealthy ranchers. You're meeting all the people who need your help, and you're coming in the town, and you're in your city clothes, and you're the outsider. Women dug them. That was a thing, and they married very young women. Um, the captain I cover married, he was 35. He married a 19-year-old, I think, during the course of the book. So, I so mean, not illegal, but still oh, a big the, age gap. <laughs> no. Unfortunately, there's like a, a there's actually a sex scandal in the book, and I had to look up uh, age of consent laws Ugh. over time. And, yeah, we're talking about 12 or 13, if there were any. So, All right, well. Yeah. So he was on the right side of that, but and she was like the belle of the county. So he's getting, you know, for, 
to be crass about it, they're getting the hottest women, young women out of all the counties, out of all of Texas. <laughs> like I'm a captain of the Texas Rangers, you know. It's but no badge, real. but no badge, and uh, the vests, you know, jackets. You know, the pictures that you see of them are always with their weapons and their sort of best clothes. But that's kind of what they wore a lot of times, um, okay. or versions of that, maybe slightly. Can you look that down. up and just kind of find it for me to for to buy later? I think it's my new outfit. I think I'm going to do a Texas Ranger outfit rest of the year. <laughs> Well, I know exactly where you need to go. As part of the research, as part of the research, I went to one of those um, SASS, which is the Single Action Shooting Society <laughs> matches. And what these people do is dress up in their finest cowboy outfits. So they're like Bell Star, um, you know. And there's a lot of men and women um, mixed in there, um, but they're all very much older. You know, a lot of retirees. There's some young people too, but. <laughs> The they're all dressed up either as like you know Calamity Jane or Bell Star. It's like a glamorous outlaw or like you know a trail trail woman. And then the guys are all dudded up <laughs> in sequins and they're using real period weapons to do a shooting competition. They're putting all this all these. Yeah, I just want to go range. to Chick Fil A in it. I don't want to. <laughs> you don't want to get your hands dirty with the black powder. <laughs> no, I just want to show up and look look <laughs> look like I'm lost. That chick. Yeah, let me have a number three eight count with a root beer. You know, I, I've never been surrounded by people with live weapons, shotguns, and and Winchesters and all manner of revolvers, and they're all and they're dressed up like they're from the 1800s. And I'm sitting there, and they come over to me, and one of them said, "I was weird because because <laughs> I went to <laughs> to watch, and I was like taking. I, I'm the weird one. It depends where you are. You know, yeah. I was the only one who wasn't dressed up like a cowboy. And I think I would like some real cow cowboy outfits. That'd be cool. They're, uh, I, you know, the real ones are functional, and the ones at the SAS didn't seem as, as much. But anything that restricts your range of motion when you're shooting, they would never, ever put on. And that is true to form. You actually learn a lot about the weapons and the shooting and the visceral And is it common it. for the bullets to be in the, in the belt? The Rangers would, yeah. They were totally going to order one of those belts. And yeah, get them so it's doubled up. So there's one on top of the other because they had the, the dual rings, <laughs> which, which is pretty cool. Yeah. They were, they, 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 they had their own, they weren't fashionable, but they had a sense about them. And that does sort of reflect on like a special operations kind of a psychological warfare aspect of what they would have to do. They're always outnumbered. You know, the most you're ever going to have really is 10, the full company or 11, if you count the captain. I mean, sometimes you get support from other companies, but these are overworked, spread all over the state. And not, you're not going to get a lot of backup. You're going to get backup from the posses in the places that you're going if, if you're lucky. So you have to exert a presence or you're never going to get anything done. People have to be scared of you because they're not going to listen. They're going to challenge you if they think, you know, so they would have these big shooting competitions on the outskirts of town. They would walk around with their, you know, there was a law that said they couldn't wear their guns unless they were on business. That was one of the things that in the 1880s um, that, that my guys had to deal with. They would, you know, they would do it anyway. But um, a lot of times they would just have to be present, right? If they walked into a saloon or in a street or crap, the big hat, the big the, the bravado, <laughs> all that is part of the psychological aspect of getting stuff done when – all someone has to do is walk in and shoot you, right? Like you're you're out of your element, you know, and you're surrounded by people who kind of want to kill you because you're getting in the way of their business or you're trying to arrest them or you're trying to arrest their kin. I mean, this is like a nasty business, and there's only 10 of you if you're lucky. And usually they're out on scouts of two, three, picking up solo people, escorting prisoners. They're all- yeah, how are you escorting a prisoner with a horse? How does this work? Uh, you chain them. <laughs> you chain them up and put them on there. If you have a lot of prisoners, you neck them, you chain them by the neck, and you march them off. And then uh, if there's one, that the, there's metal metal cuffs um, that you can chain them with. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a rough business. I mean, and the, the Texas prisons were absolutely horrific too. So why you would fight instead of being surrendering to the Rangers, I – Read the chapter in the book, you know, or any section in that book that describes the prisons in Texas. At the time. And when does this book come out? The, I think it's going to be December as well. It's due in June. Okay. Um, I'm done right now. I'm waiting on one piece of evidence about that sex scandal. It's church minutes. Um, one of my characters married a woman who 
was involved with one of the founding ministers of this Baptist church. And I don't know what happened exactly. So, but I know it's in the minutes because, cool. <laughs> because she got kicked out and she got sanctioned somehow. So, okay. So <laughs> you've written four books that are pretty awesome. Um, have you read the audio? Is there audio books of each one? Um, space, uh, all but sunflowers, unfortunately, okay. but yeah, spaceport earth and, uh, inferno both have audio books out. And good readers too. It's cool. You get to cast them. You get to listen to them reading your stuff. Oh, so you didn't you say, do it? No, no. You got to get a pro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I would have, but I would. It would have taken a hundred times longer, and it wouldn't have come out nearly as well. These guys are very, very good. Sweet. Um. Okay. So that's just book wise. Career wise, you're at Popular Mechanics, and then like, or just I guess, give me an overview of career. Oh God. Um. Yeesh. So yeah, I went. Um. Well, I grew up in New York. And um, wanted to get off the East Coast and good choice. Yeah, it, it didn't take, but it, it finally <laughs> has. We'll get to that. Um, but I went to University of Missouri, um, figuring it's a journalism school. I didn't know. I'm not good at anything. Like I'm not handy. <laughs> I'm not sporty. Like I'm not getting a scholarship anywhere. Like I got to find somewhere cheap, and it was cheap back then. And uh, and I wanted to get somewhere far away, and I wanted to write. Like I stumbled into the school newspaper and was like working there um, for a little bit in high school. And I knew I like writing. Like I go home and write. That was what I did. So I went to a career day actually with a bunch of friends of mine. And um, then we're going to go and we had a bunch of beer that we stole from my brother. Um, my friend's brother had a bunch of beer and we <laughs> stole the beer. So we we're going to go and drink the beer and get You're wings. pretty much a Texas Ranger is what you're saying. Uh, basically, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> I didn't have VD. Um, I, uh, so yeah, we go over and, and like, well, we'll go to career day first and then we'll go and get drunk and get wings. So that was my high school plan for that day. And they all went running off to their little disciplines and I had no idea. So I went over to the, to the career desk woman who was like 160 and I'm like, well, I don't know where to go or what to do. Like, this is like, a, I'm, everyone's picking schools and careers and I don't know what I'm doing. She's like, well, what do you like to do? I'm like, well, I like writing. She's like, well, you pretty much can't do anything. You have to be a journalist. <laughs> All right, well, what are the three best <laughs> journalism schools in this in this room? It was a Marquette, Mizzou, and Kansas. And so I talked to all three of them, and I liked the the flyer. You know, it, had, it looked like a nice campus. Um, so I was like, I'll go to Missouri. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> and I'll become a journalist. And I did it like an idiot. But, um, but honestly, it's only it, – I can't imagine doing anything else. I yeah, and off. I also think that's the best – like when people start going on college tours at 14 – and do all this, like, they're just making it their career and their life around where they go to college. It's idiotic. Where you made your life about what you're going to do in your life. And and what my father liked was that it was a trade school. I mean, they don't call it that, but that's what it is. The other schools that I looked at didn't have an actual newspaper on the stands that competed with the daily newspaper. And they had that on TV and radio also. It sells ads, does the whole thing. So you're out on the front line doing so. I covered my first homicide before I could legally drink. Like, that's that's good. Keyword that's really on legally. legally. <laughs> yeah, well, after my previous story about the chicken wings, <laughs> I couldn't get away with that the straight face. But, yeah, that was it, man. I, I But when you find something early, y- you risk being constrained a lot. Like, if I was, oh, I want to be a lawyer and then went on there, then you're stuck on – I mean, lawyer, you can get away with it. There's some latitude, but you know what I'm saying. If you if you, you can pigeonhole yourself too too quickly, and the good thing about journalism is that, hey, you know how to write. You can write about anything, go anywhere. And um, what I decided was I wanted to go to Mexico. Well, I wanted to go to Latin America. I happened to get a job in Mexico, and that was my first job out of school covering the National Congress for an English language newspaper in Mexico City. Wow. Yeah. Green. What part of Mexico City did you live in? Uh, let's see, Pol- uh, Polanco. Okay, yeah, I mean it's the nicest part. I lived yeah. in Condesa for a little bit. Condesa is nice too. Uh, Roma is Roma. Those are I, kind of my three. That's where I stay. Well, when I got a new job, I moved to the nice place. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Uh, when's the last time you were back in Mexico City? Oh God, I vowed I wouldn't return with anyone that I cared about. Oh, it's super nice now. It was. I liked it back then too, but I can't. I'm. I get real nervous in Mexico City because of. Well, when I was there, it was rough. It was bad. Like, um, Colosio had just been killed. The, you know, the narco situation was out of control. Chiapas was still very hot. I mean, it's not like it's completely settled now, but it was bad. I mean, the economy is what killed it, though. I mean, 
all the great things about Mexico City, the art institutes, the museums, the, the food, the, the food. Well, the food was good then too. I cannot oh, say it's so good you. now. And the and the nightlife was amazing too. But you know, you're in a taxi and the guy's telling you about his engineering degree. You know, and you know, and the the cops. You know, you know, p- having people on the staff getting killed and having the cops instead of calling the ambulance, like picking through their their cars and their and stealing from, them, and then getting robbed and. You know, and hearing every story back at the while you're trying to do your do your work, which is like covering crime in Mexico City and covering politics, which is the same thing. It's, <laughs> which is the same. Thing. You know, it's the greatest. <laughs> it's the greatest job and the worst job. The cool part about it was that you're sitting there. It was you know, it's, and this is my first job out of college, and I'm in a I'm in a newsroom with like guys who are like you know on the run with Alamo from alimony scams and cokeheads and talented journalists who are just either on the skids or trying to make their mark or whatever and it's like this perfect expat mix of global you know how did you get here type people and we're sitting you could smoke at your desk and you're so you're sitting and you're filing your story with a cigarette you know and the windows open there's the craziness of Mexico City going by and you know you've got this like United Nations staff around you and it was awesome, and you're covering the, the craziest stuff you could ever imagine. You know, as a cub reporter, had scandals at anywhere else in the you world. You were a coke reporter? Cub oh. reporter. <laughs> I was like, there's a reporter just for that. <laughs> oh, well, there was a whole newspaper just for that. But that's, you know, you, you, People are doing their layouts, and all of a sudden their nose would start gushing blood. you just got to figure maybe there. <laughs> it was during that time when the Mexican cartels were taking not money, but uncut coke as payment. From the Colombians. It was that weird transition. And when the, the cartels were... What ready, year was this? I was there. So I graduated in 91. I was there in 92, 93. And I was born in 94. There you go. <laughs> well, screw you. <laughs> Watch Narcos, man. That's all I can say. That, that's just real. Um, yeah, because... Yeah, it was out of control, the whole place. It was a great place to cut your teeth as a reporter, but it was dangerous. And, and, just, and it wears on you because you see a lot of bad things happen to people you like around you and... You know, so I got out and got to Texas. Have you been there since? I've been to Mexico, but not Mexico City. I, I haven't been able to nut up and go. I haven't had a good excuse to go either. Okay, to be well, how about you come with my wife and I in a couple months? It'll be awesome. I'll do it. <laughs> I, I, I will. I'll grab Amber and we'll go. I'll do Yay! It. I, and that's saying something. If I can bring her <laughs> down there and feel safe, it is. Look at me. Look at me. If I survived, it is very safe. I've been to so many <laughs> worse places that I would go back. I would go back to Afghanistan. I would go back to Moscow in a, in a heartbeat. I, you know, I would do these things. Mexico City has this special place of just like extreme highs and lows for me that I have been very, very loath to go back to. I, you know, I, I'm in Naples getting stalked by street kids, you know, who are trying to get at me with their little knives. And it's like, this is almost <laughs> fun to me, but if you put that same thing in Mexico, I would freeze up because it's like, I, I don't know, I don't know what it is about that, but and I loved it so much, and I, I still have some very good friends from that that period, and they don't ha- suffer the same sort of PTSD, yeah, and they went through way worse than I did. I don't have any excuse. It's just there's this one place I think in everyone's life that's just the the scary room in the Stephen King story, and that's it for me, man. That's. Uh, for what, and I'll go to the border, which is infinitely worse, <laughs> yeah. right? Like I would do, I would go back to Chiapas as well, which is absolutely gorgeous. I go back to Guatemala in three seconds, and I got in trouble there too. Like it's not anything against Mexico; it's something about the phase of my life when I discovered yeah, exactly. how rough the world is, right? Like I thought working at McDonald's when I was fifteen was rough because I saw drug dealing and like, hey, the cute girl in school's got a black eye and stuff like that. But this was like. <laughs> Holy shit! That girl I work with just got killed. Like that's a yeah. that's a different okay, order, so right? I I have a client that was there around the same time you were, and when he found out I moved there, he like pretty much flew to me to get me home. He's like, you can't. I mean, he just thought like, is his you know he had the same kind of thing where it's like when I'm in there, it's like it's the only safe part of Mexico for the most part. So you have like the resort areas which mm-hmm. are paid off to be safe in Mexico City, and it's like the only place with non corrupt cops. It's the only you know, and it's oh, like that's a nice change. Then. Yeah, so they've um, I didn't like those guys. They put cops. <laughs> there is like two cops on every probably every twenty cars. There's I'd two. I'd be cops. terrified. I'd be terrified. <laughs> In I think it was week three or something, and I'm sitting on on a bus going out to um, where was I going to uh, 
was it Soshi Milko? I think I was going. No, uh, what's the water? Um, the water gardens. Is it it's not Soshi um, Milko? It's what is that? Damn it! If I knew I was talking about, it, I would have looked that up. Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so I'm on a bus. Computer, we don't say we don't. We used to have a computer here, and it's. Uh, I've decided to change our setup, and the new computer hasn't come in yet. Or he'd be able to Google that. <laughs> yeah, and my phone is off. We're, we're cut off from the world. Oh no, uh, the hive mind. We're not. We're not plugged in. So Just and Google like water water parts or not, it's like or, um uh, oh jeez. Oh, <laughs> it's all right. This story doesn't really depend on it. I thought you'd dig it because you you live there. Um, I never went. There. I was there like a short time. So, uh, all right, there you go. Yeah, I got to see a lot of the country, which is cool. Over like a year and a half. Yeah. But, see, I was always scared, so I went to the pyramids. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was like scared to really leave outside of like I essentially I had my my favorite taco stands I'd go to. Yeah. I had my favorite uh, like breakfast places. I'm really a big food guy. I don't drink. I don't smoke. So it's kind of what I enjoy. And I'm a big poker player, so I'd have my favorite like casinos. Um, and <laughs> the floating gardens. That's it. I never went there. Yeah. It's very cool. You go out on these boats and there's like other, you know, the vendor boats come by and sell you fresh fruit or drinks or, um, actually they have like full meal type things too. Yeah. Yeah, And just long, it's a, it's like an homage to the Aztec floating gardens, um, that were kind of in the same area ish. Um, (laughs) but but, so, but I see a cop in Mexico and I think the only thing I know that's good about, the cop is that I can pay him off. Hopefully if something goes wrong, like that, that's my mindset. Yeah. Week three, I'm sitting on a bus. I'm heading out to somewhere and we get sideswiped. Another car hits us. Right. Um, and the entire bus immediately scrambles to run off. And I'm like, what well, is it on fire or something? Like what's going on? And I asked the lady like, Hey, you know, chaos. Is, <laughs> she's like, well, the police are going to come. You don't want <laughs> to be here when the cops show up. <laughs> And so I flee with everyone else, and I talk to her after, like, what would have happened if I stayed? And she's like, oh, they take you in for questioning to give a statement, and they would keep you there and keep you there and keep you there until you paid them something to leave. I'm like, they would do that to me. And like, no, they do that. I said, but everyone in this bus is running off. It's like, well, if they saw anyone who looked like they may have some money, they'd want them to be a witness too. So everyone just flees. Like, where am I? You know, I'm, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm 21 <laughs> and I'm supposed to be covering the police department. And I am in a place where I have to flee the scenes of accidents because I'll be you know, brought in for questioning or something. It's a it was a different world. So I think that affected me, you know, as a person growing up. And to me, I felt safer outside of Mexico City, um, the exact opposite of your experience, because we were out in an area where the people were just sort of acting like people and we weren't being preyed upon by professional predators. Yeah. Like, and not just the cops, but mostly, um, that was it. You know, we get on the, you know, in those small towns and villages or beach places and not a lot of trouble out there. Most of my trouble I got into was in the city and and that includes Chiapas. And that was very, I was down there for a couple of, almost three, two and a half weeks or something. And, only only good things. And I saw uh, there was a lot of tension and checkpoints, and they marched and they <laughs> lectured and they saw Americans and they Have wanted to talk. Have you seen some of these was, uh, funeral, uh, like uh, uh, where when people die, uh, what's like graveyards mm-hmm. of like, uh, like they're like these $500,000 homes they build on their graveyard? Have yeah. you seen that in person? I, only from a distance. <laughs> I didn't go jump in and check it out or anything. Somebody, well, it's, I saw like a Vice article or something. <laughs> You okay? Yeah. See, there's one drawback of the effort. Let me get you a napkin. Nah, it'll dry. I'm okay. Are you sure? Yeah, okay. keep keep it rolling. <laughs> it's no big deal. <laughs> That's one frame. Um, she'll, like, she'll like that out there. Dumping cards. It's nothing she hasn't seen plenty of times before. That's the screenshot. I'll, that'll be the cover photo of the That'll be my author photo for the Ranger book. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, oh, horrible. So okay. So, all right. So that's first job, man. That's, that's, that was out of the gate. Yeah. <laughs> that was the, and nothing's been quite as exciting since. No, it's all been <laughs> up, uphill since then. No, there's been a lot of weird places and a lot of strange All right. So adventures. what happened next? Um, so yeah, so, <clears throat> so things were getting a little weird in Mexico. Um, and I wanted to leave the city so much. I quit the paper. 
And I'm like, oh, I'm going to travel. Um, I've got eyes on Cuba. I know I can get there from Mexico. This might be the only chance. Back then, I was like, I might be the only chance I really get to go there. So first I wanted to go south. So I went all the I went to Palenque and had a fine time in the ruins there. And on a full moon in Palenque, like the entire world community shows up. I thought it would just be me. It's like, oh, I can sneak in the ruins at night and like see it at moonlight. It would be cool. Now everyone has that idea. Every drug seller, <laughs> expat weirdo, um, mystic, <laughs> um, oh, everyone wants to be there for this. So it was like this great like party atmosphere. It was very like very fun. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm going down memory lane on that one. But then went to Chiapas, and that's where I get this phone call from. Um, an e- I'm sorry, I got an email call. Corpus Christi, Texas, where I have a job for you. And it was my friend Karen from University of Missouri who worked at the newspaper in Corpus Christi, the Caller Times, and said, there's an area. We need someone who can speak Spanish who can go into South Texas and, you know, do do an area report and cover everything, crime, politics, you know, everything but sports. I said, well, beats this, I guess. I, <laughs> you know, I'm running out of money and I'm going to run out of money in Cuba, like in maybe a couple of months. So I – Got a job interview from Chiapas, and they said, well, when can you start? And I said, well, it's going to take me a little while to get there. Three weeks after that call, I I wound up in Corpus Christi, literally washed up on the beach there and recovered myself. Worked for the daily newspaper for another year and a half before I moved back to New York. Okay, so you get back to New York, and you've now experienced life. Some. (laughs) Some. Yeah, New York was, uh, was a... That's my home, right? So uh, no matter, I'm not ever going to live there again, I don't think, but it's still home. Home is home. I wanted to get back there very badly. Have you been there recently? Uh, Not since COVID. It's pretty devastating, I've heard. Yeah, I have plenty of people reporting on how awful it is (laughs) there. (laughs) And I'm... I'm, I have this weird remorse that I'm so far away. I mean, I live in Portland, Texas. You know, it's like on the outskirts of Corpus Christi, um, where I moved back after, you know, 15, 20 years away. My first job's there. Now All right, I'm so first freelance. job there, I'm, and then what happens after that? Yeah, so I go back to New York, and I got a my, – my, my idea was I'm going to go there and freelance, but I need to live, so I need a job, but I want it to be an interesting job, but – I'm not really qualified to do anything. So I saw an ad for a private investigation firm that d- did a lot of like due diligence on financial people. So if you're a venture capitalist or any kind of investor, you want so- the rundown on someone, you hire this firm and they send their little mercenary reporters to do the public records and interviews or whatever the client sort of wants. And uh, it was crazy <laughs> like what a what a crazy way to learn public records like skip tracing and you know just that whole world of scams and business malfeasance and how to go through divorce records talking to you know ex-wives and ex-business partners just like cd cool stuff all right you know? tell a story there's got to be one story that stands out well there's a lot of you can't like there's, <laughs> there's very little field work right like there was only like two two real times i went out to gather stuff in the field, which I thought was always the coolest part. But the really breakthrough stuff that would happen was all just reporting. And um, I can't really talk about some of those, but the, there is one that story because he's dead now is sort of germane. Um, this, the name came through one day and we had a big board up on the wall and had the name of the, of the subject and then when it was due, basically, and then the red, and who was assigned to it. So I got assigned to Madoff. Before Trello. <laughs> Madoff. Sorry. I, I was sitting, like, in the back of my mind, was it either Ponzi or Madoff? <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Bingo. Bingo. So I'm like, yeah. yeah never heard of him. Bernie <laughs> Madoff. All right. Like, I'll, I'll take it. So I, you know, make all the calls. We do things and and. The way the place worked, the you know, the, we had the primary investigator dug up, a, dig up a lot of the really deep financial stuff, and then we'd go through it, and then I'd trace, chase down the leads, and he thought something was off with him. He's like, you know, we start talking to people, like very regular rates of return, like, oh, well, I'm going to give you 24%, and you get 24% exactly, and it's like, no one ever does that over and over and over again. It's like, well, that's a good thing. The client, I work, they're getting their money back. It's like, yeah, but it's a red flag. 
Yeah. And here's another one. And, and, and there was nothing huge and glaring. I saw a meme the other day that was like, why won't people just promise like 4%? Like, why won't they scam artists? <laughs> There's no right. scam artist. It's like, I'm going to give you 4%. <laughs> it, it's classic pigeon behavior. <laughs> if you prove yourself greedy, you're vulnerable. And it's like a self-selection for wanting to be scammed. I want to believe that some <laughs> prince somewhere is going to give me money to launder his money. Like it, it's part of it. Like, wait, you're you find, telling me that when I wired four grand this morning to wire me a million, that wasn't real. <laughs> you may have some problems. That's it. Every con depends on that. If the, the, the old, you know, money drop where you find 500 bucks and you split it with the guy and then it goes back around. If you're not greedy, it doesn't work on you. It's a self-selecting process, right? Oh, like that's yeah. part of that's part of the scam. I've seen some coffee on your headphones, and it makes me laugh. That's a, I like that look. <laughs> it makes me look like a badass. So here's the big red flag with Madoff, which is the only reason why it's an interesting story instead of just a self-aggrandizing one. Part of what we do is call the desks that police them, right, that are supposed to keep the files on, hey, he did this wrong, we looked at this, and they're supposed to tell us that kind of stuff. So we... I, that's part of my routine calls, right? So I call up and I talk to the desk, NASDAQ, um, and the, the regulator there. And he says, oh, yeah, Bernie, he's, like, ah, he's a good guy or whatever. Like, you know, there's nothing on him. We were, he's, he's all clean. We don't have anything on file for him. I was like, well, fair enough. Like, we checked. <laughs> that after, well, no, that early evening, like 6.30, 7 o'clock, my desk phone rings. And by this point, the only people on that desk phone were the, the regulator people, right? The, the other interviews were down the line. So I hadn't called anyone about Madoff. And Madoff didn't know that he was being investigated. I get a call, you know, I'm like, hey, hello. You know, then, oh, I must have the name of the firm, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, Hi, this is Bernie, Bernie Madoff. I hear you're a private investigator looking into my, uh, my business. And I was like, hi, <laughs> hey, buddy. I can't really talk to you. My client hasn't authorized me to interview or anything. He's like, well, just so you know, if you want to know anything, just give me a call. And <laughs> I'm right here. And I was like, I know where you are. If I, there's nothing I'd like more than to have my client allow me to interview you, but I can't even get into. And then by then I knew that he knew that I wasn't, I shouldn't have even said that honestly, but hey, he was kind of being, he's pushing around. And I wanted to see how he reacted because I want to tell the client, this guy is acting like an, Nut. Like, that's not typical business shit to threaten the private investigator. Tipped off, I'm pretty sure, by the regulators who were looking at him. His buddies on that desk told him there's a PI looking into him, and he called to intimidate. That was his first reaction was to call and intimidate the PI. How did he know to call me the same day I talked to the regulators? Know, that's so crazy. I wonder how he got away with what he got away with. You know what I'm saying? So he so. just bought off everyone. I want to say bribery, a good reputation is uh, worth more than a checkbook. I mean, he's not Al Capone at the time. He's just a, a well-connected person on Wall Street. And those are the people regulators sometimes rely on or rely on to not look at too closely or they're just not a priority. And he, God only knows where those people go after. And if they tick off too many people, how are they going to get a job outside? You know, they, you're the you're a good defense attorney because he worked for the prosecutor. That's all I'm yeah. going to say. So yeah, I thought it was all very weird. It's all sound and fury signifying nothing, but that's and how much longer after story. that did he go down? Oh, years, years. <laughs> I was like, I know. And it, what the weird thing is, I actually, I did not keep the report, but I asked them, this is way back when I was like, I need to explain to my journalism people that are going to be hiring me what this job is. They're going to have no idea. They're going to think I'm a, you know, a Pelicanos in L.A. or something or dumpster diving. Like I'm a public researcher. Like I'm – that's good for journalism if I can get back in there. But so they redacted a report and gave it to me, um, mostly just the, the really saccharine stuff. And then – but it was that one. <laughs> but it, so there's no information on it. But I knew it was him. I got crossed <laughs> and I called my boss. I go, hey. Do you remember that? And he's like, oh, yeah, I thought that guy was bad. He thought he had him dead to right. So we could have brought him down years earlier. I'm not sure how we would have, but that guy was a good PI. He still is, I'm sure, a good PI. So we could have we could have had a crack at him. But, again, the greed got in the way. They didn't want to hear the red flags. I think that client wound up investing with him too. I'm pretty, I am almost 100% sure about that. Yeah, people hear what they want to hear. That's it. That's how these things work. You open yourself up. 
to the evil. <laughs> that's how it, that's how the evil works. So you're in New York. You're doing this. Then what? I yeah. I knew I got. I had to get out of that just because because um, I'm a writer and that's not writing. There's a lot of learning, but not a lot of sharing of the information. And what and this weird twist of fate, the Associated Press was hiring for public information researchers. It was tailor-made for me. It was a very strange set of circumstances, the News and Information Research Center. And they would take, you know, I'll just, as an example, um, we'd do public records research into breaking news. That was basically a writer, or features too, but mostly the breaking stuff. So it's a horrible example, but it's a, it's a real one. Someone shoots up the city hall in San Bernardino or whatever. You know, every news organization is looking as soon as the name is released, to get all the data on the shooter, you know, priors, neighbors, you know, spouses, everything. And um, you're racing CNN, Reuters, like, you know, all the, the A-list research people, and you got to get it to the AP. If they're not ahead of it, they're late. You know, that's the Associated Press. They're, that's their bread and butter. So you're on the cutting edge of all this breaking news. It's really a cool place to apply all the stuff that I learned at the PI, the private investigation job into a complete journalism setting and it really helped get me back on the path to journalism after i veered off of it which i have done on on occasion but always managed to get back to writing it's the only thing i'm good at i'm telling you <laughs> it's not because i haven't tried other things i'm really not any good at anything. I'm not good in a corporate environment i'm not good with a boss anymore i'm really I'm just, I'm just all right so yeah i mean tell me so what you've I mean, to work at Poplar Mechanics, right? Right. I mean, to work there is, like, awesome. That is, was the coolest. And the road there was, again, dumping Associated Press and New York and burning everything down and going to D.C. And the reason why is 9-11. Um, so, you know, I'm freelancing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm skipping – parts of my career but it's not parts that are all that interesting <laughs> uh, the, you know i came the, i came back to new york and, and dallas a couple of times um i worked for the dallas observer and then went back to new york to freelance uh, just in time for 9 11 basically so i was working as a freelancer for time and that was it i had my interview with howard chua eon who was a, a editor there a fantastic editor and um he, it was Thursday, and he interviewed me Thursday. He said, well, you know, we're New York. Things happen here. We need someone to go out and cover it. But mostly, you know, it, it's not, the stories come from elsewhere, and we edit them here. And if there's a gap or something we need, we'll call you or a stringer like you. So you might not get any work for a long time. You know, be patient. So September 11th, you know, <laughs> I call time, and I'm like, uh <laughs> Got your hands full. Where do you need me? He goes, go down and file something by four. He goes, get everything to do, go. But if you don't file by four, you're not, it's not getting in. Um, I didn't know that he was cooking up one big multi-page package, um, the special edition that was going to come out the next day, like a, a miracle of journalism. Like everyone from the people on board, the vice president's plane, to, to, to dopes like me, uh, you know, and Grand Zero to – Everybody, you know, the, of the grounding planes, everything, 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 all in one big narrative is like incredible. So, uh, so I go down there and filed by four, and um, so after that, it was like, let's think about defense. I always liked military. I always, you know, I always wanted to get into the military technology specifically because that's kind of where my interests were going. And by then I'd written Sunflowers um, or had sold Sunflowers and I was writing Sunflowers and I was really getting into the history of things, right? Um, and all the re weird military things in Sunflowers that, that popped up. So I went to D.C. That's where you go for jobs like that. And I wound up at National Defense Magazine, which was a hoot, a great trade magazine that just focused on military technology for, um, and for all the services, credit card expense account not really an expense account but a credit card and a travel go you're not supposed to be in the office whatever we're covering is not here it was kind of the ethos and great editor sandra Irwin, who's in dc now um 
working on Space News, was the editor, like a, an ace. And then Roxana Tyrone was like my my wing woman. She was working there ahead of time, and she's like a completely badass reporter for Bloomberg now. Like it was an amazing staff. Like if you look back on it, it's like wow, that's a, that's a good staff right there. Um, I'm taking myself into it, of course. But we had so much fun. We wrote a lot of really great stuff, and I learned a ton about how to cover the Pentagon. And when I went over to Smithsonian Air and Space, I had the feature writing from the book and from working in Dallas writing features for the Dallas Observer and then applying that to what I knew about defense and the features I wrote there, that's how I got into air and space. And then I got poached to popper mechanics from there. So I don't know if that's of any interest, but that's how it happened. It was like a, so, some calculated risks and a lot of dumb luck. What, what, what's the stuff you're writing about in 9-11 and was there ever things you weren't allowed to write about? Like were there – like was there anything – Allowed by who? To, I guess the newspaper or allowed by – okay, so there's no – Red tape, and then the Pentagon no. it seems like is impossible to ride on. So how did you get in there? Oh, you just show up, really. <laughs> I mean, I, the, the the Pentagon is it, it is a weird place. I mean, it's it's it is kind of clickish in some ways, but it the military is so big. There's a lot of ways in to whatever you want to sort of get at, and a lot of the places that are reticent to let people in are the are the ones that are like besieged by media if you go to something that's equally interesting get in on the side route you can find for example if you really want to cover a military operation embed with the people who get them there as soon as we got to afghanistan my my photographer and i the first thing that we did was go and interview the maintenance people who who kept the helicopters in shape a good popper mechanics thing, right? Like that's interesting. The helicopters are everything in Afghanistan. So let's figure out what what's wrong with them. Combat damage, and then and the operation. You know the operating environment. You talk to the people, fix it. If you want to know that, no one talks to those guys. Yeah, ever <laughs> loved us, loved us, loved us, loved us. We got rides everywhere from then on. The helicopter people loved us, and we had a taxi service basically where we could go into a TOC and say, hey, like, we want to go to such and such base. Like, when are you guys going to go? Like, hey, we need to ride home. But we had to do that once. We got sent to the wrong place, that which is horrible. I'm like, I got to get back. I got to get out of here. And they sent uh, – I mean, they do ring routes. It wasn't, like, special for me. But you can wait for weeks for a ride in Afghanistan to get anywhere. And we were jumping on helicopters. Yeah, where are you boom, sleeping? Boom, boom. Uh, we're mostly uh, Salerno, Fob Salerno, in a, in a little barrack area. Sometimes you're like in a hotel, or is there hotels? Like, where do you like? I, I wouldn't if there was. I wouldn't be in a <laughs> damn hotel. I think it's a good target. No, no, you're on a base. Okay, um, and you're like, well, at at uh, some of the places you're just with the troops. Like wherever you can just lie, you lie. And I always liked that better. Um, at the Fob that I spent the most time, forward operating base is Fob. Um, at that base which is you know, a little more removed, but it's still big enough that they actually had like a tent set up for visitors. Um, and that's where we, that's where we stayed. But you those were, visitors were sometimes other soldiers. They were international types, media. They just throw the cast offs in there. And it was kind of close to the wire, which is not where you want to be when I think that building got damaged when Fob Salerno got blown up a couple, it was like a year and a half after I left or something. They breached the wire. They definitely blew up the PX where I bought my backpack. So, <laughs> Uh, did you meet any famous soldiers or anybody that's like done anything cool? What in Afghanistan or yeah. since? Um, or since? Yeah, I met a couple of cool soldiers. They're all kind of <laughs> cool. The, the you know the the person there that I think about the most, and I did meet a lot of very interesting people, young, old, you know, from because I hung out with a lot of like, the doctors, the ER people, the chaplain, like everybody. Like I tried to get around a lot. The person I think about the most was, and I don't remember what her name was right off the top of my head, but I remember she had a, um, she's like a, like a, not heavy, not skinny, like solid, you know, you wouldn't want to arm wrestle her. She's like a very yeah. cross a girl, solid person, <laughs> just like, not even just like a woman, just like solid person, like push her, she's not going to move kind of, you know, one of those people. I always think like. Marines like if you bounce a penny off their face, <laughs> they're gonna flinch. She she kind of had that, but she was a mother of I think three, two or three, and 
the nicest human being, and she was she had some dip in her mouth, and she was spitting it into a can, and she's an Apache pilot which is the most aggressive helicopter that I think that you could probably be in. I mean, there's, there's not any humanitarian <laughs> applications for the patch <laughs> that I know of. It's built to kill tanks and people. Like, that's it. And um, we were talking about her kids and talking about her life and talking about her job and what she likes about the Apache. And we we're doing a mission. Our, the mission, One of the missions I was flying on, she was planning that one. So she was walking me through everything that the helicopters were going to do, where we're going to drop everyone off and all this stuff. So uh, I finally said, like, you, you're, like, a very nice person. Like, you show me pictures of your kids and, you know, what, you know, but I know that helicopters, you have a certain amount of choice on what helicopters you fly. And the people's personalities usually fit the helicopters they fly. And you're in an Apache. And she looked at me dead on. She smiled and a little tobacco on her lip. And she goes, I like to kill shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> You are an amazing human being. Like, <laughs> you're everything, you know? And, and at the same time, she's planning the mission and, and like, showing this, like, in, and she's an, a pilot, like, amazing. Helicopter pilots are incredible. Like, you know, all pilots I have a lot of respect for, but helicopters just want to crash. They want to crash badly. They want to fall out of the sky and kill you. And anyone who gets in those things and flies are hats off. But an Apache and the things that they do over there, and you know, it, Something about the duality of man or say whatever you want. But she I think about because she's a complete and utter badass. And you think, all right, the template to that is you sacrifice so much of your humanity. And it's like, well, you don't have to, you know. And that was very interesting. She was a very wise person. Now, that's the, the part I'm sort of missing. Like she was solid like physically. Like you couldn't push her. But she was so solid psychologically. And she so grounded in who she was and what she was doing there, of all places. Like, yeah. uh, th- and that's in short supply over there. Like, not like, oh, I'm like gung ho on the mission. Like, definitely gung ho on the mission, but like the the bigger shit. No, she's like, this is what we're gonna do to keep everyone safe. Here's what I'm gonna. She had it so well organized in her brain. It was like it was it was an amazing process to see her doing that job and have enough time to talk to her at the same time and get it. At the same time. So it's not like they change out of uniform and then you see them at happy hour, which happens sometimes in the military. And like, <laughs> I'm trying to be a different person. And it's like, this was just her. So there's just no bullshit in her. So I do think about her a lot. I do. It's like matronly killer over there. Who's, yeah. uh, and everyone there was like, you want her flying. If you don't get the colonel, you want her flying overhead because she doesn't let bad things happen to you. That's her reputation on the ground. It was cool. It was very cool. So tell me... About space. Oh yeah, my other, <laughs> my other book. Um, you got to be more specific. All right, yeah. So I, I have this thing where I, we talked about the start of the podcast. We talked about it before. Um, I'm just amazed that people just kind of gave up on going to the moon. Oh like, yeah. Everybody talks about Mars all the time, and I'm still maybe I'm just not very smart, not a forward thinker. I don't know. I'm still very like, hey, I'd kind of like to know more about the moon. There's a lot to know about the moon. Well, the good news is that there's no Mars without the moon right now. Um, everyone, I, not everyone, but the people who are going to Mars want to stop at the moon first or are going to be hired to stop at the moon first. So but what I mean by that is NASA's plan is to land a woman and man in that order, I think, on the moon um, and – probably set up a short-term sort of base there, a habitable base, sort of like the ISS where people come and they go, right? So that's the plan. And from there, what they learn from that, they want to extend to land human beings on Mars. My personal opinion, I think someone else will have already landed there ahead of time, probably Elon or somebody, Elon Musk or somebody else. But that's the NASA plan, moon, Mars. Now, Elon Musk wants to go straight to Mars, but there's a lot of people like you are interested in the moon and his, his shit can land there. He's definitely, definitely doing that. So he's already got one customer, a Japanese billionaire, who's going to fly around the moon with 100 people as soon as the ship is ready. That's already in the books. He's already put down, a, no one knows how much money, but enough money to get Elon Musk's attention. Um, so he's got that going. So that's moon-focused. And what do you think a trip to the moon is going to cost me? You? Yeah. When do you want to go? I don't know, 30 years. Too much. <laughs> so it's not soon. 
No. Dang. Not for all. Uh, of, not for all of us. No. All right, just That's leave. Like gonna <laughs> yeah. You're gonna have to settle for orbit or or stratospheric flight. And oh, I know what I would. Uh, okay, I want to go back to the moon. But you mentioned this before we started. Uh, balloons, balloon company. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, tell me, tell me all things balloons because I look at balloons and I'm like, it pops, I die. Yeah, I yeah balloons. I am a huge, huge supporter of bo- of bo- supporter. What do I? I, <laughs> I like balloons. I think they're underutilized, and I'm not out lobbying for them or bumper stickers. <laughs> I heart ballooning. Like no, it's not like that. But balloons are awesome. I mean, they they you can use a balloon as a satellite to relay a signal. That's the that's your basic thing without having to put it in orbit. So there's one cool thing about them. Um, they can be kind of insidious too. You can put a balloon up with a license plate reader and a and something to measure speed, and you can have something a, a, the ultimate speed trap. So I mean, balloons are are good and bad, but in space flight, put them up to the stratosphere. I mean, my one of my the companies that I covered in Spaceport Earth is called Worldview, and it's a bunch of real heavy hitting space people. And since the the company's done a lot, they've split off from their scientific to their human projects. So what they want to do is put humans in a gondola in your, any human, you, me, whoever can afford a ticket. You're not wearing a space suit. You're not wearing a pressure suit. You're not wearing a flight suit. You're wearing whatever you would wear to a bar, right? There is a bar in the gondola. You sit, you eat, you float up to the stratosphere. You can see the curvature of the earth. You can see the ozone layer. You're not an astronaut, but you're pretty close, and you're not on a rocket. So you go up real nice and smooth, climate controlled, and you come right back down. And that those flights actually might – they should have started already if they didn't make – the company made so much money doing scientific stuff that I think they sort of put the, the tourism part in the back seat. So they split into a new company, and now there's a tourism-specific balloon company that's setting up. And they were set up in, in Tucson, but I think now they're going to be in Cape Canaveral. I mean, down in Florida, so I have to catch up on that. But worldview, that's the that's the best way of getting to quote unquote space that is going to be the most affordable for Yeah, so what are we looking at? Like fifty grand a ticket, hundred grand a ticket? I think it's oh God that I you know, talking pricing in any space is like, <laughs> what, like what, one fifty maybe or okay. something like that, a hundred, something in that range. It'll and maybe go down if so, the gondolas get bigger. So essentially they build a giant balloon. Mm-hmm. That can. How do you get back down? How do you get back down any balloon? You just let some gas out. Oh god, that no, freaks I mean, me out so much. It, it happens all <laughs> the time. These are these are very well known physics. When it comes, think about the physics of a rocket. How dynamic and insane those are, and how many things have to go right for. What do you it to know get. about blimps? Blimps aren't as cool as balloons. How, what's inside of a blimp? Whatever you want to put in it. You mean in the gondola or the gas? Uh, like in Goodyear blimp, like how do those things work? <laughs> I'm not a Goodyear blimp expert necessarily, <laughs> but yeah, no. You, you, hey, they look li- like you know everything. Let me just some, ask oh, random I, questions. Master bullshit. Like they're lighter than aircraft, <laughs> so hey, the, the the difference between the balloon is that it's it's steerable and has propulsion. That's a dirigible. So the Goodyear blimp can move like this, whereas the balloon doesn't have that. You know, it doesn't have those kinds of flight control surfaces. They use different dynamics to get up and down. Basically, but they, you know, it's there's like the ballooning competitions where you put the hot air balloon up and then wherever the wind goes, that's kind of where you're riding it. And hopefully you don't land in, you know, Serbia or whatever it is. And uh, which is a true story that happened to one of them um, during an international ballooning competition. <laughs> they landed in a war zone and another uh, other people died in a huge huge updrafts. We did an article in Popper Mechanics. I'd forgotten about until just this very second <laughs> about ballooning, but it's not like that. These are precise up, down, right? Also, they're, they're big and robust and have enough steering and capability to weather any conditions up there. And these days, we know the weather conditions at every strata of the atmosphere makes it a lot safer, too. Okay, so to confirm, Elon Musk is taking a Japanese billionaire and his hundred friends around in, the moon in a bus. And how does this work? Like, do we know what it's going to look like? Masa menos. Um, we've got. It's going to be the Starship, the, the one that's being tested and blown up right now in South Texas. That's the. That's what it's going to look like, but with windows, essentially. Um, the super heavy booster, the thing that carries it into orbit is being designed now, and that's going to be huge. It's bigger than Saturn V, 
you know, dozens of engines, heavy lift, and it's going to have this Starship on the top of it. So the thing that's being tested now is the upper stage. And what he's developing is the thing that carries the upper stage. So that huge rocket that you see blowing up is only the tip. Okay, and so the one... Yeah, so it's only the tip that we keep seeing that he's... But eventually it will go up, and then it will detach, and then it will land, and he'll reuse it like he has with Falcon? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Have you watched that happen? Yes. I watched the first double, well, the mission double. um, The two... I'm sorry. (laughs) I saw the... Yeah, the first time um, the two boosters came down at the same time on a mission on the super heavy i saw that live and it was the trippiest thing you know <laughs> that i've ever seen probably it's just I, i've seen like things that are very sci-fi and cool and and i'd like to think that i'm like jaded or something or or at least experienced but you can't there there were a lot more experienced people than i who saw that and we're like on the verge of weeping because it was <laughs> such a beautiful audacious ballet of just like Pure ro- just rocket science and and also like the audacity of humanity. To do you do think this. Jeff Bezos wakes up and goes, "Man, I wish I was Elon." I think he wakes up and he says, "I wish I could press fast forward like <laughs> eight years so I can I can look him in the eye because he's beating my ass so thoroughly in the space race." <laughs> Bezos is a great businessman, but he's not getting things up into. He doesn't have the. He's got relationships and he's building hardware, and it's a great great company i mean honestly that the stuff that they're designing is good but we've got this other entity out there who's just doing it in real world yeah, real I, time i and, guess what i love about them. space Hats so much compared to blue origin is that space Hats is actually making it happen like blue origin just announced that they were able to relay their rocket well they had done that a bunch of times they're yeah. on the verge of flying human by the time this podcast comes out they may have already flown humans that's monday <laughs> oh, I thought it was a lot longer than that. No. All right, no, well, it <laughs> may not, actually, yeah, it may not be that far behind that. It, so the edit would be <clears throat> when this podcast comes out. It's probably going to be a couple of weeks before they actually fly humans on Blue Origin. So he's making progress. The part about Blue, but he's of, not making money. He's still putting a billion dollars of his own money well, to it every year, right? Well, he's got some strategic partnerships, but those have to pay off too. And that's the problem with attaching yourself to a bigger program. That program loses, you're shit out of luck. But his engine, but for him, it's still a win because he's developing his hardware with partners on government programs. So he's not, I mean, it's Jeff Bezos. He's not dumb, right? <laughs> like he's, but he but he's builds, not as smart as Elon. There's no way. He's not as reckless. He's not as bold. And he's not as lucky. I'll, I'll say all that, um, and and there's some luck with Elon in that the timing of what he's trying to do couldn't be better. Like NASA needs him to do this. The markets are great with him. Like Tesla is feeding his money. You know, the billionaires are interested in space. Like all, there's a lot of things that are trending in his way that you know, and keeping commercial crew alive through four different administrations. Would have any one of those things would have killed him and set him back for a decade, but everything went well. So that's the luck part. The audacity is what really sets him apart. And I'm going to test, break, do it in public, and keep going. In spaceflight, that was completely unheard of. Bezos can't isn't doing that. He'll build a satellite factory to build his satellite network. Right, like that he wants to do a Starlink. He has the whole factory set up now. He's got the rocket that he's built. He hasn't launched anything, right? Like, and then you look at Elon; he's got thousands in orbit, like totally different, totally different approaches. And you think, well, eventually Elon's going to hit that limit where something's not going to work, and it's going to be a real bad day for him, and everyone's going to realize he's too reckless. And that never happened. He blew up payloads, not those test blowups, but like satellite on the rocket blew up. Wow, that's like a big deal. You know, he's got an FAA up his ass in Boca Chica. He's got. The government man, Adam. Right, he's so smoking weed on podcasts. Like he's doing all these things, and nothing stopped him because his hardware is so damn good. I read this article about, or there's a video actually on YouTube, and it was that he's uh, there's like ten homes in the neighborhood where his rocket is in Boca Chico. That's what it's called Boca Chica Beach. Yeah, um, Villa, the Boca Chica. Village. And they've been trying to buy them all because their windows blow out every time there's a launch and all this uh, yeah. stuff. Um, There's a risk that windows are blown out. I don't think they've ever blown out a window yet. I feel like in this video, maybe they just showed maybe somebody they else's. I don't know. But 
in the video they were like, you know, uh, the homes they paid a hundred grand for. He went and offered everybody like two hundred fifty or three hundred, and most have sold. But like five, like there's still people that are there that are like, yeah, you can afford to pay us two million. I know, <laughs> I know two holdouts for sure, and one of and one piece of land that reopened that they thought that they didn't know was going to be available, and someone else bought it. So, so the land grab is still sort of going on down there, and he wants to make his star base city out of it and all this and that. Um, How many acres does he have? I, I don't know. No. He's got so many holding companies. I don't, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it's not a huge complex, but it's grown so much that now it is huge. So when you first went down there, it was an empty beach and a trailer up the road, and now there's two, <laughs> there's two launch pads. A third heavy orbital one being built. There's and an, tracking antennas that have sprouted out. There's a high bay, low bay, total outside, almost fully outside rocket manufacturing facility laid out. You just drive by and look at it. Tank farm with uh, all the gases and everything in there. It's a solar field. Like it's been growing so much recently that it's astounding. Once his attention is fixed to it, and there's no obstacles with all that funding. Stuff just happens. It's like China level progress. <laughs> like it's the only thing close. Like I, I, you know, taking building a bridge here takes a generation. Yeah. So talk to me about, uh, you know, America. We're the greatest country ever. Uh, <laughs> talk about these other lesser. <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously. Like, what is Russia? What is China? What are these other? Like, are there any other countries that have come close? Like, what are, what are they doing? Do they have? You know, they're not as capitalistic as us. I'm guessing they don't have a dude like Elon Musk putting people on the moon. They don't need one. Um, yeah. Talk to me about what are the, these other countries, kind of how they look at space. Do they care? Russia is oh, – they're going to hate this, but uh, maybe I won't go back to <laughs> Moscow anytime <laughs> soon like we were saying. Um, no, Russia's kind of a fading space power in a lot of ways. Um Which is weird to say because the Soyuz is launching astronauts. They're part of ISS. They have the best heritage in space flight in the world. When we talk about heritage. You know, they have Yuri. They have their logo isn't as cool. Their logo isn't as cool, but their hardware <laughs> is bitching. I mean, you cannot argue with the Soyuz, that thing. I interviewed Nick Hague, who was an astronaut who uh, survived that ballistic reentry during a failed Soyuz launch. He loves that thing. He's like, How does that work? Which part? Uh, of something failed in re-entry yeah so what happened was they they flew right, so they launched and it's a gigantic rocket out of uh <coughs> excuse me so they launch and the you know in a normal rocket launch the in a soyuz rocket launch they have these side boosters these side engines and they are supposed to fall off right at a certain stage and of then flight. elon's they fall off and land again Elons fall off and land. These just <laughs> land in the the, uh, the Russian step <laughs> and are just basically wasted money. That's that's why spaceflight costs so much. It's because the hardware is not reusable. I mean, if you threw your airplane away every time you flew in one, it'd be pretty expensive. <laughs> that's uh, what we've been doing for generations. So, um, yeah. So, but what happened was one of the boosters clung to the to the side of the rocket. So there's four boosters that fall away. Three of them fall away. One of them. The, the pin doesn't work, essentially, and it instead of flying away, it dives back into the rocket and blows the whole thing up. Behind, so you're sitting on the on a pencil tip and behind, or actually a, a firecracker I'm so tip. mad we don't have a computer ready because I want to pull up a video of this. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculously scary but when you see that happen, and then it blanks out because the whole rocket disintegrates beneath these, these guys. So that it's a Russian and an American in the capsule. The capsule automatically detaches, does a little sidestep maneuver. It's got rockets that have been sitting there, designed since the 70s, waiting for this terrible moment to happen. This is Russian engineering at its greatest. Like, no one could have predicted it. You know, it wasn't built for that, but every stage of the flight had a safety mechanism. You cannot say that about the space shuttle. They died on the way up on their failed launch. So... Say what you want about the Russians. Our engineering kept people alive in the shuttle. Okay, so it deta- it moves them out, and then the capsule has like a parachute. 
Just, well, it's a you know it's made to come down that way anyway. Oh, okay. But in a much gentler fashion. So when you're uh, when you're coming in from space, you're shallow, and when you're coming in on a failed ballistic reentry, you're coming in steep and hot, very hot, and it's dangerous. That's you know the g forces can be really high. Back in uh, an earlier incident, the g forces hit something like twenty g's in the guy inside, and then they landed. And then the parachute dragged them off a cliff, and then they fell down the cliff. So those two, one of the asterisks never flew again. They're both really hard, badly injured. So they made some design changes. That was in the 70s, and the design changes ensured that every stage of the flight you'd have a safety mechanism. You could detach the parachute, and you would be able to handle the, the G-forces would be a lot less because the way that the capsule come back down. So after the thing explodes, the capsule's still going up because the momentum is keeping it up, taking it up. So they've got some time to kind of say, all right, what, where are we? Where are we coming down? We're, that's just a capsule. It's a jump shot. It's a basketball with no propulsion, you know. It's just <laughs> up and down. So where you release the basketball is where it goes. So the moment where the rocket exploded, that is a really big piece of information because it's going to determine where you're going to come back down so you can get rescued. That's what they're calculating on the way up. And they get weightless. You know, they know they're not going to get to space, but they're up so high that they're in zero G and there it is, like space is right there and they're not and they're gonna fall back down to Earth. It was like must have been heartbreaking. And he he said, and Yeah, they lived though. I interviewed him. <laughs> they came back down. The the Soyuz has a parachute and then at the very last second has these little retro rockets that shoot out to sort of create a little blanket of thrust that settle you down real nice and easy. And that's how that's how it worked. They came cruising in. Now, if those rockets didn't, would it just hit and they would break their backs or? Yeah, those rockets have to work. Okay. Yeah, they, they're coming. It's too big, heavy, fast. to It, need, it needs that um, very much so. And that's the... It, that is, and that that's the the whole theory behind Elon's. Yeah, why was he the first guy to do this? It seems like so logical. That is a stellar question. <laughs> the reason why is because everyone was in government. Everyone was a government. <laughs> there was no interest in driving the prices down. I mean, everyone wanted access to go up, but no. Yeah, one I guess I just had to, to think be... like the same people that created the DMV. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ran a space program. <laughs> some some industries are itching to get disrupted, to just disrupt the fuck out of them. And space was one of those. It was ripe. What to are just some get others? Keistered with well, the automotive industry, definitely. But my mine, this is is the airline industry. Hub and spoke is idiotic. I don't care. Economically stupid, environmentally stupid, customer definitely not definitely not <laughs> in the front of that one. Hub and spoke is you should go away probably. And I think in a generation probably, well, if you get small, uh, and now electric vehicles are actually, fl- I'm sorry, electric airplanes, and they're actually becoming reasonable now. I mean, they're, it used to be like, yeah, sure. <laughs> How are you going to make that work economically? Nice idea. So there's going to be electric planes? There are. There's, there's electric small planes now that are pretty cool, that are pretty good. You have a, a fleets of smaller planes that can take people on bus-like schedules, why would you need to go and fly into Austin just so I can then fly to Denver? Like, it's the hub and spoke model really only benefits the airlines and the and the and the hubs where they're based. But everything else is it's, it's garbage. It's a horrible way. You'd never build it that way right now, would you? You just wouldn't. That's a, ready to be disrupted. And if someone with a lot of money and a re, and good hardware is going to come in there, and the technology and the and and when the technology and the economics and people's perceptions of it all come at the same time, pff, boom. The, you, you, it's big things can fall. NASA can completely change. ULA can be rattled. You know, these are all space things. But you can knock over giants, Boeing and Lockheed. I mean, they're, they're reeling from this stuff, you know. Imagine when it's American and Delta. It's going to be glorious. Oh, man. Okay, well, I want to dive deeper into this because I, in my mind – I've watched a lot of budget airlines go under the past 10 years. Yeah. It's like they can't find they, – they try everything, and they can't make it work in the numbers. Ryan and Lion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what was the one? Was it Wow Air that, was that, <laughs> that just shut down overnight? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was – that's a classic <laughs> of the genre. Hey, it, I'm telling you, everything has to be right. 
for the disruption to actually work. That's where the luck comes in, too. There was a guy... But I'm guessing it's because they, they finance these planes. They have huge payments. They take gasoline that's super expensive. These planes. And that's so, the problem. So you're saying the better solution is smaller planes that use uh, cheaper energy. Yeah. Cost down. Sunflower oil, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been done, but it ain't, it ain't not the best. <laughs> and I'm the biggest sunflower fan there is, and I can't claim that one. But, yeah, no, they, it is used in biodiesel as, as an additive. But, no, it, it's why you want to go to a huge airport. You know, why would you elect to do that when there's another way of doing it? You would take a helicopter to where you wanted to go on a short hop if you could afford it. You just would as a consumer. The problem with hub with the problem with the budget airlines is that they're flying into airports. They're flying they're they're flying these, you know, hard to make money from airplanes into airports that are run by essentially the their competitors who are the lifeblood of those airports. Like you can't blame the airports for backing the big guys. Like they're not going to get the good gates, not going to get the good schedules. Those are political horrible knife fights. Between the bigs, listen to Delta and American arguing over terminals, and you'll see, how can I show up? You need one of the – there's so many underserved airports in this country, and they all want someone to land there. And they're in – they're everywhere. They're ready to go. I mean, all you need is a short runway, and a bunch of people want to fly there, and then you you determine the schedule based on what your frequency might be, and then you can surge it. Oh, there's a music festival. Let's get more there. What can that? What's the surge capacity of that small airport? Are there other small ones there? Maybe we can make a. You know, there. Keep it a little bit more flexible. Keep it more in tune with the what the customers actually want. They want to drive 20 minutes and fly in a place that has no lines. They don't want to f- drive two hours to wait in line in, in COVID infected terror soft target San Antonio airport. Like no one. What about that experience is pleasurable to anybody except for the airlines and the airports? Nothing. Ready to fall. Ready to fall. I'm telling you that all the dynamics are like getting real close. All right, what's next? What are other some? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Baseball. No, I don't know. <laughs> that would, that's always been the top of my list. I think um, space was big. That public transportation. I don't see. Uh, I think self driving cars in. Urban Do you have a Tesla? No. Oh. No. I have a Saturn View of 2008. <laughs> I don't drive nice cars. I, I think that's stupid. Your well, target for everything. <laughs> and everyone drive a well, crappy car that works really well mad max it you're good i won't go into this i have a <laughs> uh, i have a different view on that. <laughs> hey i know i appreciate good cars I, just, I like driving in other people's good cars i like checking out i mean i worked at popper mechanics for almost eight years and i had the best car guys in the world sitting behind me yeah like, that's i so got cool. a good i appreciate cars but i appreciate tactics more and when I'm out on the road, I'm in tactical mode. I'm um, going to the, you know. Do you know up. a lot about renewable energy and stuff, or energy in general? Like, I, not enough to yammer on in a podcast, but I know some shit. Okay, so I've always been curious about. Uh, I need to sneeze, but I don't know if I will. Uh, I've always been curious about hydrogen, mm. and why that hasn't been more prominent. Because Isn't it, it explosive? Like one. Um, yeah, but I mean, like, <laughs> well, so I, is gasoline. So whatever. Yeah, I guess I've I've seen that like if you put hydrogen in a car, what comes out is like water at the end of the tailpipe. Yeah. Um. And so I don't. I guess besides besides batteries, like in gasoline, what are some others that you think that maybe automotive industry like big people have killed because it's too much competition to them? Or the only thing with cars, except for the self driving stuff, which I think is interesting, um, and only good for urban and long haul trucking. So you'll see probably long haul. Yeah, when is uh, Tesla's semi come out? Oh, I don't know. I think it looks sweet. I know. I would drive that. He, those Teslas starting to look better. The company's still a little e, but but they're finally getting their own. It's, nothing in cars makes a damn difference except for batteries. And in fact, nothing about the automotive industry to me. I and I know it's important, but I don't care about it at all because it's <laughs> just the way people get around. Blah blah blah. But. When the batteries get good, the batteries change more than just cars and more than just transportation. If you've got batteries that can actually store energy at the capacities that people in the automotive industry and Elon Musk really are looking at, the cars are just the product. The battery is the thing that changes the world. I mean, 
renewable energy is a joke, period. Except if you can get the energy from where it's being produced to where it's needed. So the wind, the best wind areas aren't necessarily where you need the power and the tidal, you know, power, especially solar or whatever. Um, all of these where you have enough room that you can put up solar panels without destroying the land underneath it or, or NIMBY, like the places where you need the power are not the best renewable power places. So you need to get the energy from A to B without spending $15 trillion on super cool transmission lines. So you need a battery, get yeah. the batteries in the car, <laughs> scale them up. And then you can, then you've got power on the floor. And that changes planes. That opens up my scheme as well because now you've got battery-powered long-life airplanes. You've got a variety of sizes for a variety of routes. And, and you don't have to worry about hedging your fuel prices and every other thing. And it's cleaner, so, you can, so you've got good marketing. I mean, that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about, all the confluence. How many to books do you read a year? Surprisingly few these days. I used to be quite the reader. I don't read as much as I used to. Uh, how fast can you read? I'm pretty fast. Really. <laughs> I've never charted it, but I'm quick. I, you know, I, How fast can you type? I never charted that either, but I Pass hunt. Me a keyboard now. <laughs> the sad thing is I hunt and peck. That's the, my the big secret as a writer. That's the, I, I'm very fast, but it it's, comes out ugly and clumsy because I'm, I never learned how to type. And I, I do the hunt and peck modified, and it's horror. It's terrible to look at, but that's how I do it. And there's no way of changing. I'm never going to try and change it. I'm yeah. Not, someone tried to make me learn how to type. I'd like go outlaw myself. I'm not going to do it. I can't. That's just my my mind and my my fingers are just. That's it. All right. Talk to me about. Uh, I guess how you make money, but more like okay, who do you work for? I have various, you know. Okay, so triads. Do you like? Write a story and then sell them the story, or do they hire you to write a That's story? That's the worst way of doing it. Okay. Um, well, when I was first coming up, it's not that different, honestly, except that they, people answer your calls now. If they know <laughs> you. But you, there's the, an idea, and then there's a story. And if you're smart, and this takes a while, and I and I'm still have a hard time with it, you, you invest enough research and reporting into the idea of it that you know that that you can pitch and then it becomes a story so like i want to do a story on you know the minuteman three missile it's like well, who cares uh, well they're going through a modernization that's introducing errors <laughs> and it's a nuke so it's really important all right now i'm talking to the editor about it well ha- now they ask me well how do you how, you know, here's how I want to get into the story. How do you want to get into the story? Who are you going to talk to? Where are you going to go? The particulars, the how, who, what, where, why stuff. If you're smart, you do that after your initial pitch because that's really heavy lifting reporting. You may not get it. If you don't have someone, that uh, an outlet for that story, they may not even answer your questions. You know, they, they're not going to respond. So you have to put enough into it on the front end that, um, but not so much that it's going to bog you down. Or else you're never going to get anywhere. Your sources are going to get pissed off, and you're never going to you're going to waste all your time. And time really is money as a freelancer. So yeah, and so you write that story, and then what do you get paid on it normally? Uh, it varies wildly. <laughs> Less than here's something I saw. And I should probably verify it, but it came from a good source. They said that Hemingway got a dollar a word in '36. So when he covered the Spanish Civil War, if he wrote a thousand word story, it was about fifteen grand in, in modern money. Fifteen grand. That story, I, and someone on Twitter responded that there are people in stringers in war zones who get two hundred dollars for an article for their, their contributions. So that's that's the state of things. I mean, that, that's not what I get, but <laughs> but I don't flats on them, <laughs> you know. But I'm not in the third world country either, so I, I would for two hundred dollars there. Um, it's not even the worst deal, but that's just that's just sort of a a sense of how little you get in this business, and it's hard to complain because I've been really sort of lucky. And but how do they make I do money from that story? I do two hundred dollar blog posts before, like I, I just to keep up with my sources. Like I'd write yeah. short stuff for Popper Mechanics and take pennies, but it's not for the money only. I mean, it's not get left. I didn't throw the checks away, <laughs> but and I also you write five or six of them. All of a sudden, you've got rent paid. Like okay, cool. There's nothing wrong with that, but 
Um, it's the best way to keep up with your sources. It's the best way to keep up on your beat is to stay covering it, stay covering it. And when you've got a book that's set in the 1800s, you, you, you're like, you, I start slacking off on the space side and I'm not writing as much on the beat and I find I get behind. So it's, it's the, it's not all about the money. It's about working your sources and being able to package that and then approach your national, you know, your, your bigger outlets, or hey, I think this is a TV show, or this is a book idea. You know, you get your big ideas by working a beat. You don't just sit at your desk and hope that lightning strikes. So that's, I have to remind myself of that often because you get these long projects, you get wrapped up in it, and then you want to get back in to the mix on a news beat, and you might not, you might not find the cycles are there for you. But with social media, how does the actual agency that paid you for the story make money? Oh, uh, web ads. Okay. And are those, I mean, are there people really? It's a crap model. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But yeah, that's how they're doing it now. Um, I don't know how to say his last name, but Matt Tabby, Tabby. He's like a former New York Times writer. Oh, it Taibi or whatever. I don't, but he's got like where you just pay him like five bucks a month and then you get like his articles. The the I know places that publish entire things, uh, like entire sort of online publications that make no money, but they set up a newsletter and they sell ad space on the newsletter, and that's okay. what makes money. Like sometimes the like product isn't models. the product. It's terrible. It's terrible, and they could have avoided almost all of it back in the day. There were a disrupt. There were a, that's an example of a of a entire system, entire economic <laughs> system, um, an entire enterprise that got taken down because it was so blind to the disruptive technology coming over it. Every newspaper could have had their own Craigslist. It could have been, and it's so much stronger locally. You know, they all could have had that. They all could have had the dating services. They could have had all, you know, everything that got co-opted. The newspapers were in a perfect position to get ahead of it. They had That's the best so reporters. They had the, they had the networks, the locals. They had the advertising stream. It, was, it would have been an easy switch over if they had just seen it. Yeah, I never thought about that, that they could have their own Craigslist. Because it would Why make, not? like, the Tennessean... Like, would make perfect sense to be like, oh, here's our buy and sell ads, and, like, you mm-hmm. know, here's cars, and, yeah, oh, my gosh, yeah, that's genius. It's perfect. It, it, it was set up right there. A bold online presence. Invest a little bit in the online reporting. Get some – jump into video early. They could have done that. They, none of the bigs did it, and the littles did it. No one did it. They did, Instead, they started cut, slashing – yeah, they just slashed and, everyone. <laughs> you know, and sell out the hedge funds. It's like that are looking for quarterly returns. It's like guys, you know, or people looking for quarterly returns. That's not how you get a continuity of operations and you're going to get a brain drain and everything else we're witnessing now. And it's no coincidence that it, the voids are being filled with this fractured media with a bunch of garbage, you know. And yeah. there's great stuff too. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the fractured media. It's like a buffet table of craziness and and brilliance and everything in between. And it's like, I love that. I love democratized information, but Hey man, you got to have some experts out there and they all got decimated. So I know it's not a lot, but I would totally pay a hundred bucks a year, maybe more just to be like, to just have like news that I didn't feel like was super biased. Like just like, <laughs> a, and not like focus just on like, for example, I subscribed to business insider because I would see their Facebook ads for articles that I found intriguing all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I found a lot of cool stuff via, via their, like I, I would read, you know, ads on a business or like, you know, oh, these people just uh, shipping container homes. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I researched the company and I reached out to them and I was like, oh, okay, I like Business Insider, this words. Well, during the election, could just be their apps broken. I don't know. But when you would click business news, all it would be would Trump, 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 Trump. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm literally just trying to find cool businesses and cool things mm-hmm. going on. Uh, and so I just wonder why there's this, um, like, everything, politics seeps into everything, it seems like. Um, and I don't know why. I mean, it's not fun. It's not enjoyable. <laughs> it didn't really used to be that way either. I mean, um, and there so were it's, places you could get refuge from that. And right or wrong, like, you know. Yeah, and so I find, like, I get most of my news on YouTube. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and like Twitter and through memes and through, you know, it's like uh, the easiest <laughs> places to access. Your it's brain not because I really want to. It's just because I don't know where I can go pay money and not get like a like somebody's opinion and just get like kind of what's going on. Well, um, I have good and bad news for you in this case, in this particular situation. <laughs> One, 
by the way you were reading and using Business Insider, you didn't like Business Insider. You liked the leads Business Insider was giving you to pursue your own research into whatever you were interested in, which is different. You're different kind of, you're not a, you're an active consumer. You're going to take that information, do something else with it. So who cares where it comes from? You're the CIA. If a cartel guy tells you something, okay. If another spy tells you something, okay. Or if some ec- economist in China tells you something, it's okay. <laughs> like, you don't care. You care about the information. Yeah. And you know that each one of these is bias. Who cares? You know the bias. You're smart. And you're taking the nugget of information and doing something with it. You're light years ahead. You know, you know, there's nothing wrong with Twitter. There's nothing wrong with conspiracy theory. There's nothing wrong with any of this if you're willing to take it and look objectively with it. And that's where people are complete gonads. They have <laughs> no idea what to do. They don't. And they'll only look for things that reinforce what they want. Yeah. And that's one thing. But if you're looking at capitalizing literally or figuratively on that information, I want to look that up. I might want to contact that person. I might want to do business with them more. I'm just interested in it. You're already applying more of a filter than most people. So – what you do with the information is more important than the information to me. I mean, what are places you subscribe to? Uh, well, the Wall Street Journal, in, um, not only, <laughs> all right, I, this is a dick move, but I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal because they reviewed Inferno and I wanted to read it. So <laughs> <laughs> they got me, right? But at the same time, I knew I was going to read it. Um, I, so I subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to anybody. I don't vote. I don't subscribe <laughs> to things. Don't really watch that much TV. I, I've been a little bit more, but yeah, no, it's um, yeah. I don't watch TV either. Uh, you know, I, I've been streaming some more stuff. That's so, why you're a, a enjoyable person to be around. You don't watch on TV. Yeah, <laughs> I've been watching all the battle bots recently, but uh, other than that, <laughs> but I love to defend that show to the death. Um, no, I again, nothing wrong with you. Anything that gives you an idea, anything that transmits that information is going to be okay, right? Yeah. And what you do with it, if you're ready for it, if you're not, you know, some people want to be manipulated. Some people want to, it was, <laughs> it used to be really fun to believe in UFOs or at least listen to an interview of someone who was talking about Area 51 and they were there and there's, and I know it's all nonsense and it was fun. And, you know, I listen to that now and it's like, if you only see that through the prism of, oh my God, it's government conspiracy and eroding our democracy. And like, everything is so weighted and serious now, but I can listen back on those shows and still not want to go burn down the Capitol or anything. Like, I, <laughs> come on now. Like, you got to trust people enough, you know, and I know it's hard because they act like such assholes, but individuals are better than groups. And, and this democratized, fractured media should be better for individuals. And somehow it's, you know, the, it's, it's, it's feeding flocking behavior when it should be feeding a lot more individuality and, and freedom of choice and freedom of what information I'm eating. Um, because you are what you eat, you know, as Marilyn Manson says, I am your shit. You should be ashamed of what you have eaten. <laughs> okay. Uh, UFOs. What do you think? You're setting me up on that one. You know, I'm working on a story. <laughs> All right. Aliens. Alien life exists probably in our solar system, which is amazing to think about, which I couldn't have said eight years ago for sure. I'm pretty damn sure because of how, because we're only looking for water and we're only looking in our solar system and we're finding a lot of water and we're finding a lot of it in our solar system and we're finding water on habitable moons, exoplanet moons outside of our solar system. There's life out there, but we're not the only living things out there. Um, okay. Fine. Are they coming here? No. Okay, then what? <laughs> that was a great response up until around probably 2018, 2019. And I just re- interviewed one of the guys who's on board one of the boats, but that's 2014, 15, and 2018, I think it is, or 19. Um, there were a series of unidentified flying object incidents of these aircraft were tracked by warships um, in outside of Florida and outside of uh, in Cal- in California as well. Two different outside of San Diego, right? Yeah, San Diego, Catalina Island area, and that's where that other recent one has been reported. So there's this area where the military is reporting mysterious aircraft that are pretty much harassing their their ships, and it's and they're taking it really seriously. And I talked to a lot of electronic warfare people, like. What about this UFO profile so scary? One, they show up at 
different ways, doing almost impossible things on radar screens, like becoming many things and then one thing, um, moving at speeds that are, you know, are, are very fast and then going to a complete hover above the water, like stuff that aircraft can't do that you see on a radar screen. You got to think someone's spoofing you. It's a huge problem. They need to look into it. But then you combine that with the people who saw the stuff from the decks and then the pilots, and then you have the pilot video. So you've got this perfect storm of multiple sensors, multiple witnesses seeing something, and the military still investigating it, which means that no one in the military was flying stuff at the time. And um, the guys at the drive, which is a cool, they do a great job with this, but they FOIA'd some records um, about that, about one of the incidents. And what they found was really interesting that the military was begging other parts of the military, are you flying anything right now? What do you, is there anything <laughs> up there that we should know about? And they said no. So that's one huge sort of, you know, bucket that you put the conspiracies in. Well, the United States is flying something they didn't want to tell about, <laughs> which I don't believe they do that that often. That's not how you test electronic warfare. It's not how you test new drones. You don't put them out in the wild. So that, so that means the Chinese aren't doing it. It means the Russians aren't doing it. Then, so by answering your question, the, I can't say that I can't say that there's no UFOs because I know there's at least three completely verified up the chain incidents where we have no idea what they were and there was something up there. I couldn't have said that even a couple of months ago without sounding like a complete ass <laughs> because we're not getting probed. Roswell was a balloon. Um, you know, these are these are things that I know, right? But. I don't know that those are not interdimensional craft or time travelers. I don't know what they are because <laughs> nobody knows what they are. Like that's and the Pentagon and the Japanese and I think the British have all changed the way they report unidentified aerial phenomena based on these reports. And it's like a it's a real thing. And Congress is going to come out in about a month they're going to receive a report from the Pentagon talking about this stuff and that's what I'm sort of doing the advanced work on. So I'm ready for whatever it says. I can go one way or the other with it. <laughs> but from where I'm sitting right now, I don't know. I really don't. And that's exciting and a little scary because I'm a debunker by nature. So speaking of drones, mm -hmm. you sued the state of Texas of her drones? Yeah, I was part of it, yeah. <laughs> Let's hear this. <laughs> they had it coming. I love Texas. I could live anywhere on the planet and I live here. So, um, And I'm not one of these new... Texans who just came down with the bumper stickers. And if you want to bring your New York, Texas, don't come here. Like I've done my time here. I don't need to hear that crap from you people. But, um, but yeah, no, they, uh, it's the worst law. It's just, it's put together so poorly that it, it, the people, I interviewed the people who sponsored it and they didn't know what was in it. I said, well, you can still go out and cover a house fire with your drone if you want to, Joe. And I said, no, I can't. I t have you even talked to the <laughs> FAA about this? Like, I cannot specifically do that. Like, your law specifically says I'm going to lose my license, and I can get two thousand. Have know. you ever talked to politicians and you like in the moment realize you never even read this bill? That's what I asked them. I said, <laughs> Did you read it? I can't. That was the discussion. Yeah. It was I. What the drone law does is outlaw a tool. You know, if I use a drone and shoot six feet off the ground at your house. I am subject to some very, very severe penalties on the federal level too. Um, but that's there. I mean, that's not true. Um, this federal law, um, I would be that I could get in trouble with, but if I break the local law, the feds could pull my license too. They can consider it, I think. So there's like, they're, 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 Got it. they're kind of one in the same, even though they're different. Um, but the problem would be the civil problem. You know, if I, my news organization would not support me flying a drone, taking an image of anyone's property of any kind. So your house or a refinery or anything, not even flying over it, just taking a picture of it. Can't do it. I can do it on a ladder. I could do it on a helicopter. I could do it from a goddamn satellite. I, you know, I could hold my hands up over your fence and take that same picture. And it's not against the law and it's way more invasive. So, what, so who cares? Why would we want to enable a bunch of journalists to go and spy on people? Well, the reason this law got passed is because some people were dumping pig's blood in a stream away from everything where you couldn't see it. And it was coming out on the other end and everyone was wondering where this was coming from. And they were dumping the pigs. So they put the drone up and they saw, it, was, it was the perfect 
<laughs> situation for a drone to say this is what's happening. Yeah. They got penalized, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they got punished, and then Texas passed the law. You can't fly drones over. You know, you, it's already, you can't fly it over infrastructure by federal law. You can't fly it over 400 feet. You can't fly it in all these airspace restrictions. There's all, a lot of stuff you can't fly it over crowds. All this stuff even back then you can't do. Reasonable. I've broken right? most of those. Uh, everyone, <laughs> it doesn't matter because you're not licensed. Do you guys have federal licenses? No. So there's nothing, there's nothing they can do. Yeah, but if you do, no, if you I do. I those, have the FFA. Oh well, then you're <laughs> yeah. then, then they're gonna throw you in the clank. <laughs> your room. Hypothetically speaking, it's yeah. kind of like every time I post speeding videos. Crank call, crank call. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, no, I was in Mexico when I took this video. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. <laughs> the FAA came after me after I wrote the article, and they said we could tell by one of your images that you're violating airspace. And I said, I know for a fact I wasn't violating airspace. Like, here's this map, here's this map. And I called the tower, right? Like, hey, I'm flying over here. Is that cool? Like, I called the tower. I have an app where you see Wait, what airspace you're in. You they're hit such it. losers. They had people, they, like, look at articles and see if somebody's breaking the law and message you? No, when you attack the FAA. They oh, did. oh, okay. <laughs> Isn't that illegal for them to go after you because you spoke ill of them? No. Oh, okay. It's, it's, I think it's encouraged, by the way, <laughs> that they did it. Does that work for the IRS, too? I, uh, I don't know. No. <laughs> they're fantastic people. Yeah. I love the really big smart. Fans, brilliant. Fans, yeah, really brilliant. <laughs> big, 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 big fan. <laughs> so, yeah. I, they, yeah they, and what it was, I was flying in a, what? Oh, it's like a, basically a helicopter corridor. Like high traffic helicopter corridor over the Trinity River at 45 feet or something like that. It was 50 feet up. I was doing something on where the toll road was going to go. So I wanted to take a look at where the river was. So I wasn't high at all. I was below helicopter. Like, those aren't on any maps. Like there are, I know that there are these like sky highways for helicopters, but they're not on the FA drone maps. They're not on any of the other airspace maps. There's no way of knowing that they'd even be there. So it's like, it's, the, you know, it's like being pulled over for having, you know, the wrong kind of air freshener in your car, you know, dangling from your windshield. It's like when they want to come after you, you're going to be doing something wrong because cause who knows, you know, what's going on there. So, and that, that, that threat was never backed up with anything except we think that you're out there doing that. And <laughs> that's, a, that's a helicopter court. Every river is a heli- in this country basically is a helicopter quarter. It's a great, and so is every highway. So if, what if I wanted to cover a highway car crash or a fire or something, you know, like the rules are not very well defined, but the punishments are very well defined and it's just applied when they want to. And that's not a good law. Uh, you know, the law should be very clear and it shouldn't discriminate against a, a tool yeah, when it's, it's, kinda it's like not how a problem. It was a knee jerk, stupid, stupid law. It was badly written. It should never have been passed. So you sued and won? We haven't won. No. Um, we haven't been thrown out, and that's kind of like winning. Um, they tried to dismiss it on its face, and the judge said, absolutely no, this is legit. And that's where it's winding its way through the intestines cool. of the justice system now, so we'll see. Yeah, I mean, our wonderful justice system that works Speedy. so, so Speedy. smoothly. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't pick this fight, um, and neither did Texas, but um, the, there are those out there who just look for civil rights type things and they called me and they said what do you we read your article and it's like a good encapsulation of what's happening and um you know how have you been damaged by this and that and i said well i'm you know i'm not looking for damages but i'll tell you how this infected my career in my newspaper um and all the things i was gonna do that i can't do i was gonna put it up over the dog dumping grounds and track you know the dog fighting people in dallas i was gonna i was thinking about trying to put little pollution measures on it to see if the methane was really coming out of you know, where the environmentalist said it was, or if it was, you know, something else, or maybe it was blown in from, like, see where the pollution levels were over DFW, because it's going to be very different at every strata, right? I mean, some of the worst pollution is probably not even settling on us. It's probably going somewhere else. Like, I want to get a little data on that and just open that up. Can't do any of those things. They wouldn't let me fly at all, actually. And the company said, we're not backing you up any lawsuits. We can't. Like, the law is too open. You're going to violate you're going to violate it. You can't take a picture of anything but a, a public park, basically. <laughs> right? That's it, you know? So I flew it over public parks. I, you know, find dead bodies there. I'd fly it over there. Like that. You found dead bodies? Well, no, no. There was a dead body found oh. <laughs> floating, and I did a piece about it. And then I flew the drone <laughs> to show where the guy was living out in the woods. Um, I also floated a 
uh, chicken. He was submerged for a long time, so it was like a forensics kind of piece. So I want to know how the you know how it macerated in that water temperature. So I floated the chicken. And I so p- who gets it into dogfighting? How does that become a thing? Just listen. I'm a dog guy. I think that you know I'd rather see infants with knives fighting than dogs like Jeez. i really i know your wife is pregnant it's probably a horrible thing to say but honestly like i i think athletes should take steroids i have no problem with gladiatorial like you know you, you know build better helmets for football but you know invent another sport you just beat each other with bats i'll probably watch well, the it. ufc is pretty damn close yeah are you a big ufc guy not big but i've been known to watch some bouts i kind of like boxing more uh, the, I know. I don't know what happened. I got older. And like, you watch uh, Israel Adesanya at all? No. He's this like badass UFC fighter. That's the guy to check out. Oh, so the, he, the elite UFC guys are so cool. He used to be a uh, kickboxer. Uh. And he's like very linky. Link, he just had his first loss ever. Um, 20 wins, one loss. And he, it's because he went up like two divisions in weight. Oh, and yeah. He's so, and, so he went a guy that was so much bigger than him. It wasn't like the guy didn't knock him out or anything. It's just that he, the guy was so big, nothing he could do would really do anything. Yeah. Um, but uh, that guy is like, he's just so, when he's in his weight class, nobody can beat him. That's why he went to other weight classes. He's like, nobody can beat me. That's cool. Man. Uh, but he does like, he'll walk in and do like a double backflip in the, like before it starts. And he just like, he's <laughs> in the middle of the fight, he'll just put his hands behind his back and just start mocking them. Uh, like he's like that type of guy. He's real fun to watch. You got to be good to pull that <laughs> yeah, kind of nonsense off. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I would do that and just get <laughs> nailed in the face. I, it turned for me for boxing and maybe it'd be changed for me for MMA because I've never sat close, but I had a sort of a ringside situation. A friend of mine was doing a book on, on uh, Jesus Chavez, El Matador. And um, we went out to Vegas. Cool name. Don't know who that is. Oh, he's a badass. Um, he got deported <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle of his career. That's what my friend did his, art, his story about. But, uh, I mean, his book. Is, um, and um, so it was the first professional that I'd ever been. And I'd never been that close. And the and it was one of the, the – it was the prelims, too. It wasn't even the bout. The first time someone got a, took a body blow. And I and I heard the meat slap, and I just thought, what that would do to me, like, <laughs> like that would cave my ribs in. Like, I'm not ready for that punch. And that guy, what? Like, that was it. Like every little punch and every little jab, all of a sudden, so that's why UFC so much is better. Scent. Well, UFC is nuts, but I don't like the holds and the wrestling and the well, crotch it all depends on who you're face watching. grinding. It's all about yeah, yeah. Because if you're watching Khabib, it's just going to be a grappling match, and that's no fun. But if you're watching like. Uh, Israel Adesanya or um, Mike Chandler, like some of these people are real exciting. Mike Chandler's this little dude. Um, <laughs> I, I've seen him in Nashville. I hope he doesn't beat me up when I see him. Little dude in the sense of he's short, yeah, but he looks like an ice cube, just <laughs> just rock solid. He like his first fight in the UFC uh, after coming back, he was like in another type of UFC fighting. He just he beat the guy in like nine seconds, just destroyed him. This guy was like yeah. top of the top. Seeing someone who's at the top of their game is always. Always amazing, but I like following fighters through whatever, like a, a phase of their career or something. So in Dal- when I lived in Dallas, there was a couple of local fighters, and we were sort of tracking them and tracing them. And it was just cool to see them kind of grow up a little. Like, And with the UFC, I don't feel that. I feel like they show up already grizzled, you know. So hard. do they uh, – back to dogs because I'm just – Oh you know yeah, anything right. about dog fighting? No, no, I only know about Michael Vick. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot more about I, I'm, the hypocrite part of, of me is that I've like made money at cockfights in Guatemala before, and like, <laughs> and I didn't feel that bad for the birds, which is weird. Like you think I would have, but somehow I didn't feel that attached. I guess I eat them, so it'd be a little hypocritical on that. Yeah, end. we don't eat dogs, but I, I was betting on them. I was getting fed good information, so it was like <laughs> kind of like getting fed winners. It was like a good thing, and then we'd go out and shoot the guns up in the air after you win. It was like a very cool scene. So, but you know, and I've seen bullfighting, and I and I saw a matador get killed, so I kind of have a little more what? like, okay, that is really dangerous. Yeah, it was on a school trip too. It was crazy. So. Like, you know, and I'm older now and I'm more like, you know, in tune with the animals, but I can't get with the dog fighting. I can't. I can't. It's just too horrific. Well, I just don't understand. Like, I just don't understand where pleasure of it comes from. And then I think, well, I enjoy UFC. We're just, you know, so I'm like, I'm, but I don't, yeah, it's just a weird, 
Yeah, you can't see the animal. Because I heard Michael Vick talk about, like, well, this is just what I grew up in. Like, this is just what they did. Like, so. You know. Yeah, well, you know what? He grew up in a lot of other <laughs> shit he didn't deal with. So that's a shit excuse from a <laughs> horrible human and a Philadelphian on top of it with an eagle. What do you expect with a low class <laughs> shit city like that? <laughs> they have what they deserve in that scumbag. I'm fine with that. But, you know, but they see. Like right in the the in the book I'm doing now at the about the Texas Rangers, there's a lot of dog stuff in it. So I don't know very much about dog fighting, but I've learned a whole hell of a lot about using dogs for hunting, and especially back in the day, right? Um, and how you train them to chase specific prey, right? And which is a pretty terrible process in itself. But what I sort of came to realize was that they do love these dogs, right? Um, they're proud of them. Like you make a tool, you train it and up. The dogs you get it. learn to love doing that kind of stuff. Um, they learn to appreciate <laughs> some of. It. I don't think they. I don't know. I think they probably do. Like a like a gladiator. Like would I would be happy a, that they performed uh, like well. But. Hunting dogs love retrieving ducks. Like it's their favorite thing. So that's what in my mind what I was thinking that maybe they're trained and they love to do it. And it's their natural instinct, sort of, you know, subverted to the human end, right? But the natural instinct to chase an animal down is pretty close to where their wiring is. Being locked in a pit, killing each other, isn't really good for that. Like they've got the fighting instinct because they fight for dominance, and they've got the dominance sort of thing. That's why there's no fighting cats. You don't have cat fighting rings because they're not. Or you know, and cocks are the same way. These birds want to kill each other. They're, but they don't want to put spikes on their hands and kill each other. And the dogs, I don't think, you know, you put out in the wild, they fight until they could get laid or eat like that's all fine and good now you're perverting that for your own pleasure so why do you want to do it are you hurting animals hurting like a herd like a sheep dog is that what you're you know what instinct are you are you well, you see their, their and faces are like mouth off and it's just like what who yeah, would I, ever want to just well how could you say you love dogs and do that but but you can love well, how creating you you a like tool. yourself even yeah I, I, it's inhuman but like at the same time, people have these conversations with me, especially working in New York City, like, why can you cover the military and these things that kill people? And how do you like that? Like, <laughs> you got to stretch out the kill. Oh, well, that's kind of the tone that they would take. It's like, first of all, you cover light bulbs for a living. Like, shut up. Like, go ahead. Like, you know, save the, the, the big boy stuff for us. But, uh, but in a real sense, it's like, all right, like, you can justify anything. Like, I think it's interesting to create a tool that can kill someone from 300 miles away with GPS core. Like, I think that's interesting. It's a human achievement. That's pretty ghastly and grim. Okay. Well, so is a dog, but like, you know, I'm not doing it, <laughs> but I saw these could really I appreciate cool, that? I don't know. Uh, it was like a, so there was like a, a military base was getting attacked and there was like, it was sending out sound waves. There was like this machine that was sending out sound. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> right. Sonic weapons are for, for have need to come a long way to be anything but a joke. So I that doesn't. It was sound, like it was like super loud except underwater, and, then it, was, and then it was sending rockets out. But it was like making all these like, like. Do you know what country? No. Well, that makes it. I mean, really it was Ameri- It was you know, it was a U.S. thing getting hit or taking off. Uh, we were attack. I guess we were. I don't know if the base was getting attacked and they were attacking back. But do they have a thing that can shoot down other rockets? Yes, I think it was that. Have you been around one of those? Oh, uh, not well. Yeah, I've never seen one work. I've never oh, had okay. to have one work overhead, but like I've seen them. That's pretty cool. I definitely look at all the vi- <laughs> the place to to check that out. I mean, Israel is is constantly getting bombarded and constantly shooting stuff down. Um, so that's always been the coolest place to look for the cat and mouse. And <laughs> hey, what countermeasures and how accurate are they? And what's the debris looking like? But now. There's a lot of other places where you can look at that same next generation stuff flying around. Like North Korea. Well, we're not shooting them down yet, but just wait. Um, Does North Korea have anything or is their tech still from the 70s? No, they have got, they've invested in long in long range missiles um, and carrying payloads that are big enough to put a nuke or definitely big enough to put chemical or biological munitions on. So, yeah, they're... They are a regional, th- big regional threat when it comes to rocketry. There's nothing third world about their rocket forces. Interesting. Um, and there's a lot of them. That's the problem. We can knock out a lot on the ground, 
we can knock out some in the air maybe, you know, coming up especially. Um, getting all of them. And, and that's just – that's not even counting the small artillery. If they launch all the small artillery – that we can never hunt down and they shoot and scoot a lot too. They shoot and move. They're mobile. They could take out, well, God, probably millions of people with their conventional weapons just on the outset. So there's not, and that's before we get to start knocking them out in the North and the South Koreans knock them out. So they've got serious, I mean, they're a mess, but yeah. I mean, you know, they can hardly eat in a lot of parts of their country, but the military eats the that's funding nice. for the rocket forces gets paid. Okay, so I was in Arizona, and there was this decommissioned rocket place that I went to when where I went to Arizona, uh, Tucson area. Mm-hmm. That's uh, where Worldview is headquartered, and it was like an eight eight story rocket. And you went inside, and you got to see, and they, you know, and they, it could. They said it could. This was like in the sixties or fifties, like, and they could go anywhere in the world in a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. Okay, that was what the technology we had then. Mm-hmm. What technology we have now? Well, I'm glad you're blown away by what we had in the 60s because we have the ex- <laughs> pretty much the exact same nukes. Um, it, the Minuteman 3 has been around a long time. Not the 60s, the 70s. And um, well, I'm, I don't know if I want to say that. <clears throat> anyway, the America yeah, – so you like the American ICBMs back in the day. A lot of that technology is exact same stuff that's being used in the silos right now. Um, they're not – been modernized it's an almost impossible task to get hundreds of silos which are like buildings underground so you can imagine all the maintenance problems they have to have absolute ready to launch (laughs) all the time and they're old decades 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 old 70s you know you see stuff down there that looks like the star trek enterprise from the old show type screens um, I went down into a silo, launch silo, and met the the two guys sitting down there, the key turners, ready to launch the weapons. And he said, look at this. And he pulled out a floppy disk, big floppy disk <laughs> from science. This is what we're dealing with down here. <laughs> and it was amazing. And the calls for modernization, we got to modernize, we got to modernize. Well, how? You know, do we want silos? Do we want missiles? Do, can we get by with just subs um, and airplanes? Do we need do we need as many? Should we put them all in one area or distribute them over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles like we do now? Like we don't know what to do because we they did it back then and it's amazing it still works. But how do you replace something like that? And it's so fraught with political problems and billions of dollars spent and no one can push it forward. No one can push it back. And it's like you know no one wants to commit too much to it. You know. And if they do, they don't want to admit to it. Like Obama actually commissioned a new warhead for the first time, which is kind of off-brand, you'd think. But shit, it's time for a new warhead. If we're going to have these things, we got to have them work. And the modernization of ICBM, he, you know, he kicked that can down the road, and now they're trying to kick it down the road some more. But why have nu- nuclear weapons if you can't guarantee you launch them and they're not ready? It's it's a having them if you. Don't want to have them, don't have them. And that's one argument. But if you have them, you got to, they got to work and you got to take care of them, right? Like that's (laughs) part of it. So there's a big divide. There's a big conversation that's not happening in public at all because everyone's staring at their own feet with other things. But our weapons of mass destruction are extremely old. We don't have a good plan of replacing them. And the plans are extremely expensive. And that's kind of where we're at now. Um, The modernization programs are moving forward and limping ahead, but the last thing I heard of the Pentagon was, hey, can we do another life extension? And that was, you know, that's already a fourth or fifth. I might be underestimating it too. These things were supposed to be retired decades ago. They're not built to be working. And they're ridiculous. Where are silos? Like in the U, like where do they, are they typically in Arizona and the deserts? No, not anymore. They used to be scattered all over the place, but they concentrated them in Montana and um, North Dakota. I mean, those places are empty. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's places to put them, but more, and they also provide good ways to get to Russia quick. Uh, you want to get there, you know, we're talking first strike, you know, you got to get there in a half an hour before their, their birds go off. So you might only have a very limited time. So you want to get those guys over there quick, over the poles, hard to, hard to see, hard to intercept. 
that kind of thing. It's a, it's a whole other world. I went to Malmstrom Air Force Base and went silo hunting, and then they actually took me down in one. I got to do some of the training stuff, I tearing the keys on a simulator, all that kind of fun stuff. So it was a it was a different different <laughs> world out there. It all was right, a good so. One. I mean, I was amazed. You know, they said, like, look, the president would call. He would give these command keys. They would type them in. They would turn. You know, it's like there was no computers, but it's kind of a computer. It was just like. Well, that's a problem with modernizing. What's the biggest threat that we that is out there that everybody has? Non-state actors, other countries, everybody. Cyber. What's the one thing that you don't have to worry about in today's ICBMs? cyber like (laughs) that they are connected through cables that run through the ground through hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles of this and every one of those cables is vacuum sealed so if it gets tampered with you know it so that's how they communicate there's no being i mean there are some other ways of launching through airplanes and antennas and all that there's other things right i mean but that is the main form of communication is a hard line hard cable line hard to hack and very hard to intercept and especially hard to clip when they're, you know, have the vacuum tubing around it. So what do you replace it? That's so old school, it's secure. You start changing stuff and introducing it. Where are you going to get the chips from? All right, it's a trusted chip. Is it really, you know, all of us, the computer chips and the electronics, are they, you know, giving, are they emitting any kind of signals that can be jammed? I mean, all the intelligence and tradecraft and all that stuff gets put into play in the modern age, and that's exactly where, Someone like the Chinese and the Russians and the Iranians or anyone who's got the cartels, anyone with any money at all can get in on that. And that's not where you want to be. What if someone can figure out a way to jam something? <laughs> yeah. It, it wouldn't, you don't have to wait for first strike day. You just have to re- um, you know, report it. And so you consider yourself somebody. a debunker? Yes, absolutely. Let's pick one. Just name it. 9-11. What do you want to know? Uh, the building that collapsed but wasn't hit. The one I saw fall? Yeah. Yeah. Fire damage? And it falls at free fall speed? Because yeah. that's been the argument to me. that. Uh, what do you mean free fall speed? Like it just falls, it like leveled so quickly. Yeah, of course. You ever seen anything pancake before? All right. You don't have to heat up steel to the point where it burns for it to get weak. And when steel gets weak at one particular point, all the weight on top of it can't hold it. So it falls down. And then that one falls down and it pancakes all the way down and it's fast and it's violent and you can feel it in your feet. And there was no booms ahead of time. There's no controlled explosions. There's none of that stuff. I was there. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> I watched it. And so do you that's think how that they plan to hit the building where they hit it? That's a good question. I've never seen, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the actual reports. I haven't seen the, the flight software that they were using. But they wanted to hit it in the middle. They hit it in the middle. Like, they close enough. You didn't want to get the top. And you can't get the bottom, so you hit where you hit. Like, like they're not great pilots. They didn't have to know how to <laughs> land, but it's not hard to steer, right, that you can hit it. They had the software, flight software simulation program, so you can try to hit somewhere in the middle. No, I, they, said, they hit the perfect shot that they were aiming for, and they knew they are going to be. No, that's no. But you're <laughs> flying an airplane into a building with an external, an exterior shell, you know, support structure network. What do you know is going to happen if you hit it in the middle? You know you're going to slice the structure. You know you're going to cause fires, you know. You hope to knock the building down right away, or you're just going to cause the whole, you know. It was a pretty bad catastrophe before they fell. They would have been perfectly happy with that, you know, I, th- I think. I think when both of them fell, it became the iconic attack. I think otherwise it would have been a horrible thing that we would have to deal with, but it wouldn't have been quite as awful. Yeah. You know, and it wouldn't have scarred that. It would have scarred the, the skyline, but it would have been resilience instead of complete collapse and weakness. I think it would have been a different cycle, but I don't think that was part of their psychological plan. I've never seen anything that said that was part of it. Um, want, making sure those buildings were down. But I think what they really were counting on was taking out the whole capital. I think that's what they, I think that was the money, the money shot right there. And if they did that one first, that's what would have happened. I think that would have been the more, the, it would have felt more like a decapitation strike. And I think that, that I think that was going to be the, the real cherry on top. I think the towers were easier. I don't think they knew that they were going to make it to the capital because of the air defenses even back then. But the towers you can get. You know, yeah, so 
how were they able to get to the Pentagon? It seems like with air they defenses. Didn't. I thought the Pentagon was it. Oh, no, the Pentagon was, yeah. Sorry, yeah. The, the, the other one got brought down. Well, they didn't have the uh, airplanes ready to scramble at a moment's notice to shoot down a passenger plane. I mean, remember September, <laughs> what September 10th felt like. It felt like, you know, not, there's no reason to, they didn't have the air patrols up like they do. Like, they, they weren't on a war footing, right? They just, they just weren't there. Like, they didn't expect it. And you got to understand also, when you look at the airspace over there, there's a lot of planes flying all over the place. I mean, you've got Reagan, Dulles, and you've got all the other you know, smaller places and, and government. That's very busy, very busy airspace. So you don't have to go that far off plan to be able to get to the Pentagon at all. It's, in, it's, it's close to the airport. I mean, it's not that it's – it's, it's an airplane. It goes fast. I mean, it, it's a missile. You're not going to, you're not looking for it. <laughs> and, and there are not air defense. There's air defense stuff. That's, I don't even remember beforehand, especially since I didn't live there, but there's not like AA batteries on the white house back then. Like there is now they had some stuff, but they weren't planning for that. They're planning for a helicopter incursion. Sure. Right. Like people on the roof, small, you know, they don't know if that man pads, but anti-aircraft weaponry is not aiming at a big airliner coming yeah. in like that. Just like they're not, you know, they'd be more ready for a cruise missile attack launched from offshore than they would be from that. You know, I mean, that, that's not a threat they were expecting. They, in a very short amount of time, during a crisis, packed with civilians, when no one has any idea what's going on. So, yeah, that's how that Pentagon hit happen. Just, it was the element of surprise. And once they lost the element of surprise, they couldn't get to the Capitol. Like, once the surprise was gone, airplanes were no longer an effective tactic. And all the security theater that followed, whatever, like good, bad, <laughs> indifferent. Uh, it, it, Wait, so. Not gonna, that's, but the one that was going to the Capitol, that's the one that people brought down, right? Yeah, the one in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So, but that was just brought down by people. That still wasn't brought down by our government. Absolutely not. No, I think it may have, though. I mean, planes were scrambling by then. If the people on board knew to attack, the people who were flying the planes, you know, the, the fighters and the National Guard were getting ready to do something about it. I don't think that one would have made it. I think I okay. think Bush would have ordered that shot down. I think for sure. What I think I think conspiracy I'm, theories. Uh, that you're flying with you, I think that it was just as far as the as far as the plane. No other conspiracy ones. I want to keep going. There's nine eleven. We've talked about the moon. What are some other ones? Area 51. Yeah, let's talk about Area 51. Roswell. I was on the Roswell TV show. But I don't know if I should talk about <laughs> that because I don't. I would. Hey, I was just the guy that bounced ideas. So off Area of 51. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is just like a place where they test things. Yeah. In the desert. That's exactly what. It is. <laughs> what they're testing is really cool stuff. Okay. Um, but and, and it is a secretive place. Like that, all that is true. And yeah, employees would get bussed in from elsewhere. It makes sense. You know, um, all of that is makes makes a lot of sense. The weird part is that that's where they test all the. It has. It's surrounded by the greatest airspace probably in the world for testing things, and that's where the new stuff goes. So. I found this in my career. Whenever there's something that's classified or secretive, or definitely if it's a weapon of mass destruction or something that is just has that secrecy around it, it kind of warps everything around it. <laughs> All the people around it start get a little weird. And like, if I'm near Montana and, and you're out, and there's a black helicopter that goes by and it lands, and a bunch of armed men <laughs> are running out into the woods. And you'd think, wow, that's crazy. Like, <laughs> that's like a government kill team that just got deployed that hand. And it's absolutely true. And that's what they're doing. And, like, it could be training and they could be going out to a silo or whatever. But you see that enough. And then, like, it seeps into everything that's around you. And Area 51 is, like, the biggest example of that. It's, it's secretive. But everyone knows it. It's there. So how do these but guys? No one has ever visited. Like it's it's in our consciousness, but it doesn't exist. It's everything that is just it's, it's hollow about. Okay, so here's this. what I understand: these guys aren't making a ton of money. Who? The guys that work at Area 51, right? Uh, so I'm sure they are. Well, they're highly skilled aerospace engineers for the most okay. part. Computer techs. You just wonder how there aren't more that just go rampant and NDA, leave. NDAs. 
And there's nothing to report. No one wants to come out and say, hey, we're building a really great new airplane <laughs> drone that can uh, has a loiter time, of, bah, 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 and they're going to nerd out, and people like me would love it. <laughs> but the general public wouldn't care. If I was going to come out and I was going to leak something, I would sell it to the Chinese or someone else. I wouldn't leak it to the media. If I found an alien there, I would sell that information off to Definitely wouldn't sell it to Fox News. I'd sell it to, <laughs> you know, Beijing or something. Like, there's better markets for that info. I wouldn't throw my life What's away that worth, that. you think? Oh, the actual carcass? If you get a tissue sample, billion. Easy. <laughs> I'm asking for a billion <laughs> for my I, alien finger. <laughs> I wish I could broker that so I could take a cut. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Just send me a text I'll when get, you get you, it. You can get the finger now. <laughs> It's, you know, that's just the thing. Like, yeah, why wouldn't more people, it's every conspiracy. Why wouldn't more people come out and talk about it? You know, and, and I never used that as a de facto, well, it didn't happen because I believe in the power of compartmentalization to my core. I think secrets can be kept, but not forever. And the size of the secret isn't as important as how many people would have to be involved in covering it up. How was JFK killed? He was shot. By Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> Sorry. And I know he was involved in all kinds of other stuff, uh, you know, Kennedy. And there's other people who wanted to kill him. But, hey, you're you're not only a president, you're that president. And you, you really ticked off a lot of people. The story there is that. Now, did he have all these mistresses that he would tunnel into the White House? I've heard this. Is that true? Oh, I think he would take him out to the pool and stuff. I think that's why Nixon had the pool filled in. Um, yeah. He – Reporters covering up for him banging women is a lot different than covering up for Johnson. You know, anyone who's saying, like, Dan Rather being involved in the con- – hey, that guy couldn't keep his mouth shut to save his life. He would be yammering on about it. But since he was there working it, he's part of a lot of conspiracy theories. And it's like there's just no way that any functioning conspiracy would have that many people unless it's compartmentalized per, you know, <laughs> you know, the organizational structure the, of any kind of organization. The Japanese like footage. That. Of like, so this guy got this like footage they sent to Japan. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Footage of what? Which of the JFK it? shooting. Oh. So we got like footage that he was like, this is, you know, this is different than the story. I'm just going to ship this out to Japan. And then they posted it or whatever. And it. it that sounds like a great chain of custody. <laughs> <I> for- <know>. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not into conspiracy theories. I just see these things. They're all interesting. You, I love conspiracy you theories. You debunk them. So. Yes. Um, Let me hear the details. It sounds right, like a bunch so, of horseshit already. But <laughs> that doesn't mean it's not fun. So this one and this angle it looks like the security like the, the guy in the passenger seat turns around and shoots him that's what it looks like in the <laughs> the governor um, oh no not in the, the guy sitting in front guy sitting in front not next yeah that would wouldn't that be common um i don't know i gotta oh, look at the footage again. so i'll have to find this and send it to you and i was like oh that's interesting but I don't, he got think but people this, in the car got shot too though uh, not this guy. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> this guy did I, the shooting. What the <laughs> yeah. ballsy way to kill a president if you're going to be sitting in the motorcade and no one ever see it coming. Here's here's where I'm at. I don't care enough to go too deep into it. So I look yeah, at him. That's and, a healthy way to be. Yeah. So like I know people that get, they get where their like dignity is all tied up. It's like when I ask things about 9-11, <laughs> they're suspicious to me. Like, I, no matter what you say about fires, I think it's odd that the building collapsed. With that being said... I have a job to do. I got a voice. I got a wife. Right. I got like so. I just move on. And he's like, "Oh, what do you think? Cool, you know." <laughs> it's it's a, it's a great. These conspiracies are a great mental exercise of what is possible. What is possible? <laughs> what do we? What do we know? We know. How do our perceptions influence us? Where? What our media intake is? Where it's steering us? Is something I believe that's true? Is it actually true? That's the most precious human instinct that you got. If you don't have that, you are a, you're a robot, and I mean that like in the old school Czech way. You are like a slave robot, not like a, a robot. Like robot came from the word slave back then. Like you are given up your humanity, um, and it's been taken from you, and you don't even kind of realize it. And what I like about conspiracies is you're challenging your intellect, and what happens is they don't anymore. Like you're reading it because it challenges what you think you know. And then if you really believed it, you would maybe would pick up a gun and try to like find out where Area 51 is and like find the rep- <laughs> reptilians who are have or the Illuminati or whatever it is or Congress or Exxon Mobil. Like whoever your boogaboo is, you're going to go and try and get the, the boogeyman. You're going to try it. But a healthy person 
processes it, uses it like, you know what? I don't know that for sure. I'm going to look it up later or I'm going to file it away or I think that is odd. That's a good point. But you're not devoting yourself to it because it, at that point you've adopted it as a belief. It's not an intellectual exercise anymore. Um, and you can't learn from that. You can learn from challenging yourself with beliefs. All, I mean, all the time. I love, that's, I love that about traveling, about reporting, about all of reporting is based on that. What do you, that person, I'm pretty sure is telling the truth. I got to prove it. Wow. They weren't like, that's the, that's healthy. And that's part of being able to process that is important. Being exposed to pathogens is important to getting a resistance built and banning ideas is not the way to go about it. It's never <laughs> yeah. worked in the past. It's not going to work in the future. And I know it's distasteful, but disagreeing with someone and defending their right to say it is pretty elemental stuff. And, yeah, and it's, anyone on any side who says differently is a bullshit artist. And I immediately think that they're a it's lesser so intellect. Scary. It's Man, terrifying. It's, like I see things where people write things uh, about, uh, I mean, I see it a lot with Trump, but the right things about Trump that if you just like, Oh, like we need to get a list of every Trump supporter. And I'm like, okay, take Trump, I'll put Jewish. <laughs> you know, Anyone, it's like it's, these things, it's like, like guys, like you're acting crazy. <laughs> yeah, that, that is crazy. And that's very and Eastern Europe. I then see like, like uh, celebrities that people are like, yeah, I agree. These people need to be like brainwashed. These people need to be uh, like, like there's acting like just, there's so much craziness. And I'm like, guys, we're not too far. It's kind of like when I am, I don't want this to get removed from YouTube or anything. So I want to say I have nothing against the vet scene. I want to just say that I have nothing against the vet scene. I just pointed out that it's a little, I just thought it was a little odd that I can't, that I see like propaganda for the vet scene. We're like, Hey, if you get the vet scene and you go, you show us your card, we give you a free cheeseburger and Instagram <laughs> has like stickers and they'll promote your, <laughs> they'll promote your post ahead of other people's posts. If it has to do with getting vaccinated, um, and then if you have a bad, uh, this was just passed where if you have a bad reaction to the vaccine and you post that, they can legally remove that. Um, and I just think, you know, this seems a little unhealthy. <laughs> hey, you, that's the other thing, like divorcing the message from the message bearer has never been more important than right now because most of the people with megaphones are, are idiots and they really only know one way of doing things like We've been conditioned growing up with a lot of propaganda and we've been conditioned to reject it because it's so ham handed and often been stupid from going back to prohibition of alcohol, prohibition of drugs, you know, believe, think what you want about those issues. You look at those campaigns and they drove more kids to smoke pot than anything else in the world because, and to try harder drugs because they equated every drug with pot, right? And they made it <laughs> so ridiculous for so long that you start disregarding all public everything. Like that's the danger of bad messaging on a believe the message or don't believe the message, the way the message presented. That doesn't change the kernel of where it comes from. So the same people who bring us the anti-cigarette smoking ads that are like so over the top that you're just like, I want to reject this because it's so manipulative and heavy-handed. And the tech giants and how they try to social engineer. All of that, that's just that – the worst are the Hollywood people who don't know shit about anything. <laughs> and they'll opine on gun rights. They'll opine on vaccines. They'll opine on childbirth. They will just go on about anything. They're the last people you want to hear from, right? So uh, you know, once again, like just because an idiot agrees with something doesn't mean it, it's wrong. And everyone needs to know that because, you know, no one's always wrong. <laughs> Trump was not 100% wrong. Obama was not 100% wrong. No one is 100% anything. And anyone who believes the 100%, that's a good way of either fading them out or taking it with yeah. a grain of salt. Like, I like it when they do you think they do that to just dehumanize somebody? I, so you look at them as like an enemy? Yes. I think that's yeah. the first step to being able to control. I sound like a reptilian type thing, but <laughs> you're trying to elicit a response. I get it, man. A vote and a and a and a, and and a donation. Those are the two things that the political creatures want of all of any stripe, right? If you're lucky, that's all they want. If you're unlucky, they want mobilization, and that's where I don't like. And I'm not mobilization to vote, which is cool. Like they're supposed to do that, but 
And I don't mean even mobilization of street protests because that is also cool. But I'm talking about mobilization of like setting up a shadow something to the other thing. That's Yugoslavia. You know, that was Nazi Germany. Like Nazi yeah. Germany was a takeover, but you got to look at what the other side was doing also because there was a lot of Germans who were like, I'm choosing stability like Russians today. I'm choosing stability. This is crazy. I can't handle these street <laughs> fights. I can't handle the economy in shambles. I can't handle this. I can't handle that. I don't like Hitler. I think he's kind of an asshole. But, hey, he's, and he had the industrialists in his pocket. Hey, all right, now I got jobs. I got this, that. I got yeah. – it works. It works. But, you know, you got you to gotta be careful. You don't set up the shadow police like the brown shirts where you the shadow – parliaments the you know all the, the i feel like we're star close. chambers we're very close to I mean, like, a lot of some I of s- that when i see how people react to like somebody not wearing a mask i'm <laughs> like man you <laughs> i know i know they're, 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 it's because they individuals are better than groups is one thing that i have definitely come to believe and I see individuals doing amazing things all the time. And of all political stripes, to be honest with you, um, age groups, demographics, I, the individuals are fine. You get people in the group and the dynamic changes. That's always been the case. Now yeah. with, and I hate to blame social media and media, but <laughs> if you feel like you're in a group dynamic, but you're still alone, you're acting like you're in that group at yeah. that moment. So if someone's attacking someone because they don't have a mask or they do have a mask or whatever, they're wearing a pin or whatever, they don't feel like they're alone. They have that entire group behind them. Even they're alone in that room or that airline seat or whatever. They don't, they're not alone anymore. They don't have that. They're, they're performing for that other bigger community audience that they may not even live near. <laughs> they may not have ever met. They may, it may not even exist, but they're, that's what they're defending. I believe this. I, you know, it's not intellectual curiosity. It's a, it's a tribalism. Yeah, there's a lot of group group thing going around. <laughs> I, it's everywhere, and you know, I, I, and honestly, like, I, I am I'm not apolitical, obviously, but I I do not trust the part of the, part of the political <laughs> parties, and the political class has failed so absolutely miserably that you know to believe any of them is a t- tactical mistake for yeah. a voter. Yeah. So where I'm at is like. I want my fellow American citizen to be in government and as an act of service and for a short period of time because yeah. they need to go back and do normal stuff. So, like, there's somebody like Dan Crenshaw in, in Houston. Uh, he's got the one eye. was mm-hmm. a Navy SEAL. It's like I like him because it's like, oh, this is a dude that served his country, had a real job, did things, ran for. That's the problem right there. You had me <laughs> until you ran for something. <laughs> <laughs> unless you just make it random i mean they should not want to be there so you got to be taken away from your normal life to be put yeah there, that's what i'm saying get the job done and get out yeah so that's, that's the only way it would ever work if you have to run it's over and you you have to be compelled to serve because otherwise everyone will turn it down but you also have to get paid because you can't take a big financial hit because then they'll be vulnerable to bribery so it's like where does it, where yeah. do you put that? In? And then also you have a bunch of amateurs running things all the time. You're going to need the continual, what, what the Trump people call the shadow government, which I do actually, there is, there has to be one because the whole thing would fall apart every four years. Otherwise, like you have to have continuity, but the policies that, that get dragged along in there, you know, some of those are very important to keep. I mean, I know it, it's hard to change things <laughs> and you have that and change is important, but Continuity is important too. In a democracy, you're whipped across four years and then budgeting every year. So anything that increases stability is going to be more prized than fairness. And right. I think that's how we got this two party bullshit. As we wrap up, what are the coolest things coming out this year, space wise, tech wise, military wise? Everyone loves the Martian helicopter, and I do too. But you know that's that's going to be fun. But the cool thing. Um, oof. there's a lot, um, let me try and think of what the coolest thing, if they, they're not going to do that. Um, probably the cool, the thing I'm looking forward to most in space, I guess, would be Elon Musk's quest to build that enormous rocket at Boca Chica. I think that has the biggest potential for, uh, being the next big game changer. When does it, it launch? When was its first? It's got to go through environmental review right now. 
So we're talking a little while, um, but it really has to be developed and tested, which is going to take you so a couple of years. Um, but that's the one. Well, I say a couple of years till it's actually flying into orbit, probably a year and a half, two years, which is really fast. Um, that's what I'm thinking. I'm sure their timeline is much sooner. I think they want it to launch by the end of the year. But there are have they ever hit a timeline before? I don't, I don't think if, so. Yeah, I was thinking, like, I don't think of one thing he's ever said that's launched on time. Yeah, but at least they launch. Yeah. <laughs> he's gotten a lot farther than I ever thought he was going to get. And, I, and again, I was really skeptical. We're going to give him a breakthrough award at the at Popper Mechanics one year. And I said, I think we should wait. He hasn't launched anything in the space. And then the next year when we gave it to him, <laughs> I had to eat crow. Nothing. I, I spiked it last <laughs> year, buddy. Sorry. But this year you earned it. Like you got something yeah. up into there. Like your hardware works and it's cheaper and it's a completely different system. And what you're going to do with it is sounds amazing. And he followed through with all that stuff. Yeah. Something he talks about in his book, which is so interesting, is like I needed a radio and a space radio is 200 grand where normal radio is 100 bucks. And so I thought, well, instead of buying one for 200 grand, I'm just going to get a really smart employee and make this his entire job. It's 120 grand a year. His entire job is this. Is this. Mm-hmm. And he's like, so then I would have a radio for $500 that is space level and I can now recreate it. And I, you know, like, well, it's mm-hmm. now scalable and scalable. It's, that's it. It's better than everything else. Yeah, you can't build a fleet if everything is this custom made. <laughs> you can't. And he wants a fleet of spaceship to going into far deep space doing stuff. That's what he that is what he wants. Are you going to the moon? Thousands. Are you going to the moon in your lifetime? As soon as someone will pay the way. Am I personally going? Yeah. yeah, I would go. I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to afford it. I have to get an assignment. So I gotta at least stay in some kind of shape so I'm not a health risk. So. Yeah, I mean, you're good. You've been doing it. For you. I feel like you've covered it for so long. You have to eventually get an opportunity. I, there are people with bigger audiences who'll get them first. Um, some of the beat reporters would certainly be on there, but no one's interested in putting media up in space. Everyone is very interested in putting people with a media, a social media presence in, <laughs> into space. You get Fire all festival. <laughs> you get you get all the positives and none of the negatives with a journalist. They're never gonna they're they're gonna be so excited and happy and following along and they're coming from a corporate job, blah 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 blah. blah. They have their little marching orders yeah. and they're not gonna talk about it. And who's gonna wanna send me up there? You know, when they could send some happy go lucky space nerd who's gonna who's got a couple hundred thousand you know, Twitter followers and doesn't ask any probing questions. I love those guys too. Don't go, don't, don't get me wrong. They're great, but they've totally usurped the, the space press. They, they'll get called in to do Instagram interviews with Elon while the trade press, and I'm not talking about me cause I'm a magazine guy. I can be a little bit behind and live, but the trade reporters are getting scooped basically by people who aren't even asking questions. They're like <laughs> literally taking a picture and putting a little blurb up. Yeah. And it's like, it's pretty distasteful, but their impact is bigger. So now I start thinking who's going to go into space. I got to start butting up to some billionaires is really what it comes down to. Well, let me know. I'll come with. Everyone wants to come with. <laughs> Everyone but Amber. I don't think Amber, I don't think my girlfriend wants to go to space. <laughs> but <laughs> I've waited the whole podcast to get into this. You've met Elon Musk. A lot. You've been around him a lot. You've worked with him. I guess worked with him. You've been around. Tell me about <laughs> Elon Musk. Tell me what's it like. Well, I mean, I don't know him real well. I mean, I interviewed him uh, three times, and I was at the um, Starship unveiling in Boca Chica and stuff like that. So a lot of the sort of moments I, I've seen him in. I said I'm not. Don't exchange emails over them or anything, but I've seen him in a lot of different settings. Um, at an award situation, a cocktail party, a one-on-one interview, and testifying uh, on Capitol Hill. Very, very different situations. And he was essentially the same guy in all of them. (laughs) So there's very something very consistent about, uh, even as peculiar as he is, he's very consistent. And, um, And that's interesting because he seems so ephemeral. His mind is here, it's there. But he's a bulldog when he settles on something and he pursues it. And you can almost see that in him when you're talking to him. He'll talk about this and talk about that. And then he'll come on the thing, you know, that he really isn't. And then he'll go to that next level and he'll get aggressive. Have you covered Neuralink at all? Hmm? Have you covered Neuralink at all? I have not covered Neuralink, no. Craziest thing. Yeah, I know. I know. And that's just it. Like, 
he's got so many ideas <laughs> and it's so easy to just knock uh, out a lot of them. Oh, that's a stupid idea. Oh, who, who tunnels? What, you know, but they do make sense and they're self-reinforcing in a lot of ways. And he's at his best when they're self-reinforcing ideas and they're not like in completely different lanes that are distractions. Um, but he has always been nice to me um, in, in different situations. The people who work for him don't have a, as flattering of, a, of an opinion. But he's a very – I think he was a tough interview because he's hard to pin down on one topic. But he's always saying something that is not inflammatory but is interesting and challenging. He loved the challenging. He's, a, he's like the ultimate disruptor kind of guy. But he hates – fools like anyone who thinks is a fool or a contrarian idea you can see that he reacts did to you it. ever see the interview with him and jack ma yeah <laughs> yeah it's you tell he's just like i hate this guy i have friends at reuters who and people on the automotive beat who've just been sparring with him and getting in these wars and like catch all the worst parts of elon and on the space side you get almost like the best parts of elon because the company is doing well and he's changing NASA and launch prices have completely worldwide been disrupted, and his hardware is is so phenomenal. So one man affected the price of the entire marketplace. He has affected more than that, but he is honestly, to, to be totally honest, and I know Bezos is a titan, right? But Elon Musk is a, a Henry Ford level complete game changer. Like he's the one that even if Bezos is, winds up colonizing the moon on his own. Elon is the one who broke down the door in the beginning and changed everything. And there's always that one pivotal person who's at the front of a huge movement, and that's definitely going to be Elon Musk moving forward. He, If it wasn't for him, things would be radically different, and we would be very much locked on, on the planet Earth um, without the kind of access that we have and are going to have. So he, for all of his faults and his weirdness and the rest of it, is an extremely important human being on the planet. He's probably one of the most important, probably the most non-government, um, not a government leader who's the most important person in the world, not just because he's rich, because what he's getting into has such a potential for impact. And if he's gone, what happens to those efforts? That's something that SpaceX can survive. Can Tesla? I don't know. You know, And would SpaceX still want to go to the moon or would they become more of a traditional launch company, what would they lose when they lose him? Now, they have Gwen Shotwell, who's a genius um, as well, who's um, the president over there, and she is the uh, the bedrock. Um, he's the genius, and she's the bedrock. So as long as she's still around, I think the company's still move forward. But would they want to spend all this money wasted trying to colonize Mars for no reason? Probably not. But is that why SpaceX is important? Probably not. So... It's an interesting dynamic to separate the man from the company, from the ambition, from the next generation. And we have no idea where it's going to go. I mean, he could very well be buried on Mars and become one of history's greatest men. You know, that is what that would be. You know, he single-handedly, like a Heinlein, you know, the man who uh, sold the moon style, changed history just by sheer force of will. That's that's something to see in real time. It's a, It's... You don't get that that often. So people think that there's too much attention paid to him are probably not concentrating on the right parts of his story. What do you think will come next? Do you think he'll stay in these lanes or he'll continue just to revolutionize? I mean, when you look at Neuralink, Neuralink has the ability to solve, like, memory loss. Like, I mean, it has, like, some pretty insane things it can do. Um, he thinks he can solve PTSD in just the beta version. Like, before it's <laughs> even live, he thinks he can solve PTSD. Yeah, I, that I don't know if I believe in that part of it, but the things he's demonstrated are are amazing enough. Um, I always think that the he'll stay focused on the things that are going to disrupt the most. The way that he goes about it he sets the groundwork for the later things that he doesn't need to be there for. For example, like he'll, he's a chief engineer at SpaceX. He's not the president of the company. He's on the the design part, the cutting edge part, and then the contracts, whatever, like that part. He doesn't go to Cape Canaveral for the Dragon launches usually. He'll be at every single development test in Boca Chica Beach. He's moving to Texas, right? Like he's there where the cutting edge stuff is. That's the only thing that gets him up in the morning is the idea that he's going to change something. Is he moving to Austin? Yeah, that's what he says. 
And that's where everyone's moving. Yeah, that's true too. I don't like much like Austin. I like the I like my little beach community a lot better. So here's the deal about Austin. Their homeless community is increasing at a rate that is like close to San Francisco Skid Row. I mean, it's like bad. And I'm like, I can't believe nobody is calling this out. Like no. that's, that's the whole reason we put Dallas over Austin. We love Austin. Still love Austin. But it was that every it's time unlivable. we visit the homeless population would double like since the last time we were there. We're like, mm-hmm. all right, this becomes for us. We're looking to have a family and raise kids. I was like, this becomes not a really smart idea. I lived in New York and DC, Mexico city and Dallas. And I have seen my share of homelessness and the way that the camps have just proliferated and spread and then they get broken up and scattered, and then they go elsewhere and reconsolidate. It just seems like this crazy, never-ending circle, but it's not. It's like a downward spiral because every time they try to break it up and they fail more, tend the flock there. And then the way they disperse them is so inhumane and ineffectual that the pushback makes them not want to clean it up again. So no civic leader seems to be able to like get a hold of this very – Seemingly, and it's not simple problem, but obvious problem. You, it's not good for the people who live there. It's not good for property. I, I cannot, there's nothing good about a tent city. It's not a humane answer to anything. It, so who would defend that? Like, how did we get in the place where that is the status quo that is acceptable when it's yeah. so obviously unacceptable for anyone with a humane bone in their body? Anyone with a civic bone in their body, anyone wants to start a family or a business, it's a, it's, it would kill a city. And New York was getting killed by that kind of thing when, when I lived there. And when Giuliani and Clinton, yes, that tag team, <laughs> what? Like Hillary Clinton and Rudy Giuliani <laughs> and Bill Clinton flooded the streets of New York with cops, which is probably shocking to everyone, but the feds would pay for a certain number of years and then the city would pay half and then the city paid everything later. And the city passed a bunch of stupid tobacco taxes to pay for it, which didn't work out because everyone bought black market. But so that part was stupid. But um, um, that calmed the city down, and nobody liked it. And then Bloomberg tried to double down on that, and he got his ass handed to him for trying to prevent crime in African American neighborhoods by getting guns off the, where the murders were happening. And to him, it was a clear problem solution yeah. set from the Clinton era. And in the modern era, it was, what is this stop and frisk? You're grabbing our kids and grab, what is this? Like, it was a completely different universe from back then. What worked back then and what was liberal and conservative orthodoxy was being applied. And it did not take. They were, yeah. People were not having it. And it's, it's just weird how much weird. the eyes of the public like, like decide something now. Yeah. The knee-jerk like, reaction is the one that seems to stick. <laughs> and it yeah. should be the opposite because – and, and it's not like they didn't have an emissary in Michael Bloomberg who could explain his position. I'm trying to save lives by getting guns off the streets and neighborhoods where they are. And that kind of simplicity didn't work. You know, there's a hundred nuanced arguments that came up against it. And it's like, and he gave up. And the gun crime and the murder rate is very, very high in New York City right now. And it's like, why is anyone surprised? Um, but that's not even my, my question is why is the status quo the lowest common denominator everyone can agree on can't be the right thing. Like that, there's got to be someone who comes and disrupts it. But you know, it's going to have to take some breaking of entrenched, you know, thinking. And every homeless encampment that I see is like a product of that. When everyone agrees, it's horrible, and no one can agree what to be done yeah. about it. And that, that is so unacceptable to me. Is Elon Musk a little bit Aspergery or on a spectrum? Like is like, would you, I'm not trying to throw him under the bus or anything, but, you know, there's just something, like, that always seems like his jokes seem to be a little weird. I mean, he named his son, like, some, I don't even know how to say his son's name. You know, it just seems to be, like, does he just have a weird sense of humor? Or is he just, like, Definitely that. he read every book, including the encyclopedias, in his library in Africa by the time he was 12. Yeah, there's... No one who's wired to see things so differently is going to be quote unquote normal, <laughs> right? Um, no one who is involved in the things he's involved in is going can be anything but iconoclastic. Like you can't sit down 
and sue the Air Force and then sell them launch contracts to rockets. Like, you don't have balls that big unless you're kind of crazy. Like, all the geniuses were, and there's a reason for it, you know. Um, And he fits that mold. But he is legitimately strange. He's legitimately funny. And he's better off in person than he is on Twitter. Um, And and he's, as much as people... Dogecoin to the moon. (laughs) Dogecoin to the moon. <laughs> um, it's God. He's moving markets with a word. It's so bizarre. Um, and like venerating him is a mistake, but degrading him is a, probably an even bigger mistake at this point um, because, oh, he's weird and he mad grimes and this and that. Who cares? Like in the end, let that be determined by the biographers. Um, it doesn't influence the policy that much. Henry Ford being sympathetic to Nazi Germany is a big historical thing because he was selling cars there. It's part of the economic story of Ford that also plays into his personality. And Musk has this bizarre personality. It falls back into his businesses, but not that much when you really look at it. Um, He's catching a lot of bullets for SpaceX. Um, Most of the calls that go to SpaceX go right to him and then get shot down. He's released his entire staff, especially the upper management, with the exception of Gwen Shotwell, who makes appearances and does great. But everyone else is media blackout. They're concentrating on their work, and he's taking all that for them. It's annoying. It's horrible for a reporter. It's smart business. (laughs) Like Every time he does something weird, there's there's, there's something behind it that maybe isn't as... Well, not the weird parts, but the business weird is usually based on something very bold and makes sense. And and it's not an act. I think a lot of rich people play the part of the – and I'm thinking of Richard Branson, who's pretty much of a douche. He's very much like, I am an iconoclast, and here's my Twitter feed with all my iconoclastic thoughts, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and they're columns <laughs> that are edited by staff, and it's like – Shut up! You know, doesn't he have a space company too? Yes, Gal- and the, and yeah, he's they killed, haven't done very well though. Well, he's killed a bunch of people, and they ha- and they're they're hoping to go to space, get their space tourism business finally launching this year, which is years and years and years too late and damages to the to the idea of what space tourism is. He's he's I think he Virgin Orbit is cool. They have a, a launching rockets from their airplane. I like that business. I like that business quite a lot. But I don't. Is that because of him or just the people he hires? The people he hires. That was, that. I can tell you, if a big he fan was, of if them. he was smarter, <laughs> he would have done that the first time instead of being obsessed with tourism. That was all him because he wanted the luxury experience and he wanted the, you know. And I've been to Spaceport America and I've seen. I've talked to the pilot. Come to my island. That's it. He's a, his <laughs> brand is luxury and space tourism was luxurious. And the whole trend is: can we make this? more democratized can we get more people up there to do serious work instead of sending leonardo dicaprio into space for eight minutes so we can feel better and get a pin like that's such a bad look for space and if you're going to do it do it already the fact that he delayed it so often that he killed people you know pilots and people on the ground during the testing for this very frivolous sort of you know launch system is a bad look you know, Virgin Orbit is a serious effort. See, I didn't even know that, which just yeah. shows how good he's done in the media. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, but I bet you know all about his mom and his this and his that and, <laughs> and like his idea about the oceans. It's like, well, fine, that's all great, but who cares? You know, Musk doesn't as weird as he's coming off. He's not writing those. He's not writing those tweets because he's normal. I mean, but we invited him to an award ceremony, and he shows up on time, right, and everything, and his. One of his ex wives is with him, and we're hanging out. And I'm like, I'm going to have a drink before the ceremony starts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get the drink and everything. And he goes, Well, so what, am I supposed to do a speech? And if you knew, if he said that in front of my deputy editor, who had been working for like three months on the schedule and getting everything that, you know, very anal retentive personality, <laughs> everything out to be all locked down, if he heard him say this, he probably would have had a nervous breakdown. I was like, yeah, they're kind of expecting like five minutes or something. He's like, oh, well, what do you think I should say? And I'm like, you're Elon Musk. What the hell are you asking me for? I'm like, uh, Mars aspiration, multiplanetary species, blah, blah, blah. 
He goes, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, like the, that's like his boilerplate. <laughs> yeah. And he walked, I went to the bar and I didn't even listen. <laughs> I was like, good luck. <laughs> I'll see you after. Um, that's him. Like he isn't acting like he's disaffected. He actually is a little disaffected. He's a little bit separate. And he bears down on things and he floats away again. And that's that's legit. That's not a rich person trying to play something. He's a legitimately weird yeah, guy. He doesn't and a seem legitimate to care about genius. money or anything. He just seems, I mean, like, he obviously uses money to get things done, but he doesn't seem to be, like, when I look at, like, like Jeff Bezos, like, Jeff Bezos seems to be about his money to me. He's calculated. He, I, I'm, the thing that I, the, one of the things I asked him was, like, you know, actually, I didn't ask this. That's I almost t- took credit or blame for that, but it was actually my editor-in-chief, Jim Meggs, asked him. Because you don't seem to suffer from fear. Like, you do very bold things, and you're unafraid to do them. And Musk said, you're absolutely wrong. I feel fear quite keenly. I remember that quote. Like, I feel fear quite keenly. Like, he does not want to fail. Like, he's not – like, Bezos, you'd think he's, like, being very calculated to guard himself and his company against risk. And – you think Musk embraces risk. He must not be afraid to fail. He's terrified to fail. This isn't failing for him. This is breaking rockets and moving forward and disrupting businesses and moving forward. That is what he's, that's success. That's his template for success. And it's chaos for other companies. It would be a horror for Bezos. He would reform the whole company and make it more traditional. Like you, it's, it, you can't divorce that mindset from SpaceX or even Tesla. And I'm telling you, his employees have it too. You go out for happy hour with a SpaceX employee, you're going to get a diatribe about landing on Mars and multiplanetary species and everything else. And it's not talking points from Elon. It's it's a movement within there to make that happen. It's a corporate in identity. But, you know, General Motors should be so happy or American Airlines should be so happy to have some kind of corporate identity that is even one third of what SpaceXers have. And they are worked like dogs, you know, and <laughs> but what they're doing, they think is important and they're seeing real results and they're flying real hardware. And that means everything it doesn't matter how bad you're being beaten in this game, like beaten up, you're going to come back. How many? Uh, so I remember I followed like when they kind of went public in a way. Uh, space ads. I mean, they're still proud, but it was it was like the story of space ads in a way. It was like a two hour podcast of it, and it talked about they did like he did three launches that he like self funded, I believe that none of them went off. Right, like his first three never. He was never like he had three fails before he ever had a success. He had enough money for one last launch. That if it, and he, they were learning something, and if I'm remembering correctly. The stage separations were a real pain. They were bumping into each other, knocking the rockets <laughs> askew, and it's a hard thing to master. And uh, they were they were down to the last successful launch. They were down to it. Like if this doesn't work, we're not going to get any more funding from NASA. We're going to get funding from anybody, and we're pretty much done. Um, and that's and Eric Berger has a really good book about that period called it's called Liftoff, and that's the period that we're talking about when everything was high risk, uh, an engineering failure meant the company could pretty much fold. And, I mean, it didn't think, you know, we're all happy it didn't because we'd all have nothing to talk about. But in a greater sense, we wouldn't have uh, astronauts traveling from the United States to the space station. We'd still be renting from the Soyuz. It would be even more expensive, more leverage for Putin. We wouldn't have launch prices, new hardware across the world. We wouldn't have a Starlink. We'd all be sitting around waiting for Bezos, like, you know, year after year as he was underperforming hurting commercial crew like spacex had to work for any of this any of the bright parts of the space flight right now um except for like the robotic exploration but even that's more important because of spacex they just got a contract to land astrobiotics water sniffing robot viper to the moon uh, in 2023 so that's a spacex ride now all of a sudden they're into moon it's, transportation it's so cool to see that jeff bezos recorded or uh recruited Space Hats employees offering them double their salary. Yeah. I mean, just ruthless in recruiting, and Elon Musk still gets his ass. Yeah. I, there's, I mean, when Blue goes, they're going to go. That's the thing. <laughs> I mean, a, that guy is, is being very, very patient, and it's almost time for them to really, 
I mean, it's been time for them to step up, I think, for a long time. And but, will you start covering them more when that happens? Well, the problem with them is not that we're not interested. They won't let anyone in. I've, no, I've, I've talked to them dozens of times. I've been to Van Horn. I've lurked outside the gate. I've talked to the I mean, I've done all that. I've hung out the hotel where the Bezos is stay in town, all that stuff. They don't let you in the door. And there's no public launches. So, there's so no, no one knows. <laughs> so, yeah, very few. They, they haven't been forthcoming. I even, full disclosure, I had a job interview there once. They were looking for some sort of media creature, and I was sort of I was leaving Dallas, and I didn't know what to do, and I thought it would be cool to go and check out the company <laughs> anyway. So I'm like, I'll go and look at it. And I'd done corporate communication stuff before at American for a little while, so it wasn't that far afield. I'm really happy I didn't do it. It was before um, – the Inferno book contract. So I was oh, tempted I to go back into <laughs> corporate a little bit um, if it was space flight. And I saw stuff there that was truly amazing. Um, amazing engineers. Very, very impressive, right? Um, the business model is slow and steady and set the table before you eat. And Musk is eat, <laughs> serve, you know, prepare the food, eat, and clean the dishes all at the same time. So... You can't rightfully compare them now in 10 years, but is Musk getting too much of a head start with the practical stuff that um, Bezos will never be able to catch up? I don't know. I, no one knows. That's the cool thing about watching it. But the time when Blue Origin starts launching and, quote, unquote, catching up and seizing more of the attention as well as launch markets is coming very, very soon. And if their partners win some of the big heavy launch contracts, they're going to get a lot of that money and be able to f- put that back into some of their moonshot programs and their human, um, so you know, the human suborbital tourism stuff and then human orbital, all the stuff they want to do. The cool stuff is going to get funded by those bigger projects. We'll see. We'll see. Um, they're going to have to come out of hiding sooner or later. And this, it's too big, too expensive to stay hidden for long. And the first thing, the big sign of that is happening within weeks, hopefully when they launch those people into suborbital space out in West Texas. Are you going to be there? They won't invite me. But will you just go there anyway, or will you not be able to see? Oh, okay. uh, unless I get an assignment to lurk outside the gate. No, I would like to see it, but not enough to camp out for free in the desert picking scorpions out of my ass for three or four days. Like <laughs> launches scrub all the time. And I don't know where it's launching from or no, I'll watch the, I'll watch it on the webcast like everybody else and then send an email begging me to get inside the gate. All I know is they keep saying when the, when the tour is open, they'll invite me. So hopefully they will. Well, my job is to become your best friend so I can tag along. <laughs> so, um, where can people connect with you? Where they can read your articles? Where can they buy your books? Amazon, obviously, but articles. Where can we read those? Uh, I, oh boy, all all over the place now. Um, Popper Mechanics. I still write for them regu- pretty regularly. Um, I'm on the staff as a contributing editor, which is not really an official anything, but um, uh, National Geographic. I'm working on something about UFOs, and I wrote about SpaceX for them sort of recently. And uh, Smithsonian, Aaron Space, uh, wrote about the Space Force for them. So those three places. But my latest stuff's usually on Twitter uh, at, I think it's at Papalardo Joe or Joe Papalardo. I don't actually remember. Spell it out. I don't know which one it is. It could be Papalardo Joe or Joe Papalardo. I know. Well, Papalardo you should spell out. Oh, P-A-P-P-A-L-A-R-D-O. Throw that in a search engine with Joe, and I'm not the guy who takes pictures of Kiss. I'm the other guy. And I don't make pizza, so I'm the other guy. I'm the guy with the helicopters. 